I've been down in Williamsburg this week and had an idea. What do you think of it? A series of books about nine-year-old girls growing up at different times in American history. There would be six books for each, and the stories would reflect the important moments of girlhood and how it changed and how it stayed the same over the years. And I, I think there's something about being involved with children's literature that just um, nurtures optimism. You can't help it. There would be a doll for each character with historically accurate clothes and accessories so girls could play out the stories. There might even be matching clothes for the girls. And with that postcard, the idea for the American Girls Collection was born. There was sort of two extremes. There was either dolls that little girls were supposed to play with by pretending to care for them, so like baby dolls. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there were dolls like Barbie that were more aspirational for girls to act out what life might be like as an adult. But there weren't really dolls that were meant to represent the same age as the children playing with them that could be more of a reflection of the children's own lives. So Pleasant Roland had an idea to combine stories that would get children interested in history with dolls that would be a reflection of the child. In June of 2020, American Girl released a statement of commitment to racial equality on their Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. This will be a good move and wouldn't have been included in this video had they actually upheld to what they said. The company continued to be held under scrutiny for saying that they wanted to represent people of color and promote diversity, and then turning around and releasing another white girl of the year the next year. <laughs> then, when they release a new black historical character, they don't promote her and overshadow her with a poorly received Truly Me revamp and a Harry Potter collab. American Girl has basically abandoned the idea of being girls across American history. And for some reason, it really bothers me that they won't admit it. So Gabriella, the first black disabled girl of the year, and she just so happened to have a small collection and is totally overshadowed by a new doll line that primarily centered on a white blonde doll. I'm sure there's no systematic implications or issues raised there but also this is alleged American Girl, please don't sue me. This is just speculation, but the rumor is that Tenny was supposed to be the girl of the year for 2017. In February of this year, One Million Moms called for a boycott of the 2021 Girl of the Year doll, Kira, because she has two lesbian great aunts who are in a same-sex marriage. On the flip side of that, I learned while researching this video, in Felicity's stories, her grandfather owns a plantation and slaves is not great and the books do have a section at the end called looking back which provides historical context at the end of felicity saves the day there is a little bit about slavery but i wouldn't say it particularly tries to condemn slavery which is not great and i just wanted to bring it up because i know that addy is kind of controversial but I think that a lot of people don't know, like I didn't, the slavery connection to Felicity's stories. From its inception, it was a doll company, a toy company, a clothing company, a publishing company, and a direct mail company all at once. But in truth, from its beginning vision, it was a company that was bigger than the sum of all those parts. It was a girl company, and anything that was good for girls was ours to give them. American Girl is a brand of dolls and books that began back in 1986 when its founder, Pleasant Roland, a former teacher, sought to find ways to connect young girls with American history. While baby dolls promoted nurturing skills and playing pretend at parenting, and while Barbie dolls provided the aspirational careers of a role model that you could look up to, American Girl dolls weren't focused on the future, and despite their historical theme, nor were they focused on the past. They they were about the here and the now, about having a doll who was your age, a doll that could be your best friend, a doll that could go on all of your adventures with you, with one twist. Your new bestie is from another time period. And along with your new bestie would come six books of decently historically accurate fiction so that you could see how a girl just like you would have lived if you were born a hundred or so years in the past. But now American Girl is entering its 38th year in operation. 
After being bought out by Mattel just before the turn of the century, the 21st century saw American Girl explode from being a brand mostly for nerdy girls who enjoyed reading historical fiction to a brand whose expansive universe and whose popularity is now reaching that of Barbie. And much like Barbie, as the brand has grown, so have the controversies, so has the drama. This past January, I posted a video about the public outrage that happened about one year ago now, back in December of 2022. That public outrage involved a bunch of far right wing parents getting super angry at the American Girl brand because of their new nonfiction self help book, A Smart Girl's Guide to Body Image, which dares to acknowledge that transgender people exist. I bought my nine year old daughter and seven year old niece American Girl items for Christmas, returning it all this weekend. I'm not supporting a company grooming children. I look forward to telling them why their items are being returned. American Girl Doll is providing a book telling kids how to take drugs. So in reality, here is what the book actually said. Messages about how bodies should look are different depending on a person's gender. Girls tend to face more pressure to have thin bodies and long hair and to wear clothes like skirts, dresses, and blouses. Boys tend to feel more pressure to have a muscular body, keep their hair short, and wear pants and shorts. Luckily, it's not your job to look the way people expect. It's your job to be you. Okay, well, first of all, that didn't even mention LGBTQ topics whatsoever. While gender expression is what you show on the outside, gender identity is how you feel on the inside. When we were reading those tweets, they were like, they are telling our children to be trans. They are encouraging our children to change their gender. I would like to point you all to where it explicitly says... Most kids grow up feeling comfortable in the sex the doctor assigned. I'd like to point you all to the place where the book literally says straight up that the majority of people are not trans. So it's not telling you to be trans, it's just telling you that some people are. It's kind of like how the book talks about disabilities and how some people have certain disabilities. If you don't have a disability and you're reading this book, is the book encouraging you to become disabled? No, it's just telling you that they exist. Telling someone that something exists is not telling someone to be that thing. It's just telling them that it exists. Okay, this is ridiculous. But this last page, I think, is the one that's got people all up in arms. Let's talk about it. Being transgender is not an illness or something to be ashamed of. If you're questioning your gender identity, or if you already know for sure that you're trans or non-binary, talk with an adult you trust like a parent or school counselor. What? Twitter told me this book was telling kids to go behind their parents' backs. But the book itself is telling me that it says to talk with your parents about it. Wait, I'm sorry. Is it possible that someone lied on Twitter? No one would lie on Twitter. It does not say go behind your parents' back and take drugs. It says talk to a trusted adult. It says it right there. If I had a dollar for every time someone who was getting outraged about the content of a book didn't actually read said book, well, I'd probably finally be able to build the giant dollhouse that I've been dreaming about for years. Covering this controversy sparked a bigger question in my mind. Where were all of these far right-wing people getting the idea that American Girl dolls used to match their values? What caused them to think that American Girl used to be a safe brand, safer than it is today at least? Do conservatives misremember the American Girl dolls of the past and their stories? Yes, they do, by a wide margin in fact. American Girl dolls were never conservative, and we're going to get into all the details of why in today's video. Now, these dolls weren't particularly leftists either, nor were they apolitical whatsoever. Actually, pretty much all of their books were political and were often set in very controversial periods throughout American history. How can the crowd who doesn't want slavery to be taught in schools also think that the American Girl dolls of the 90s were on their side when we have a whole series about a doll who literally escapes slavery? How can the people who don't support labor unions glorify the American Girl Dolls of the 80s when Samantha, the first doll released along with Kirsten and Molly, was a pro-union activist and an early feminist who cared about women gaining the right to vote? None of these things made sense to me, but then I remembered that I also don't remember everything. So here's the thing. Right-wing talking heads aren't the only people who look at the past with rose-colored glasses. All of us do. So as I dove into this, I started to wonder if there were things about the brand that I misremembered. Did I think that the brand aligned more with my values than it actually did? Was this brand always as feminist as I remember, or was I too glorifying my own childhood, solidifying the dolls that I grew up with as obviously the best ones? 
And this is where we get into our big research question that will drive today's video. What exactly are the politics of the American Girl Company? Beyond just the obvious, beyond it being a brand that wants to make money, what values does American Girl push? Contrary to what people like Matt Walsh and his wife believe, has American Girl actually grown more conservative over the years? Or has the capitalist notion of just playing it safe for profit always been the undercurrent of the brand? Today we're going to explore all of these things in depth as we take a deep dive into the history of the American Girl brand. Back into the ways it used to be in the 80s and 90s, the ways that it's the same today, the drastic changes that the brand has gone through. What were the values present in American Girl's literary materials? What do these dolls represent? Has the brand gotten lazy in some aspects, pushing toy marketability over the timeless educational quality of historical fiction? Has the brand improved in some aspects, like greater diversity among the dolls? Has the brand become Barbie-fied? And if so, what does that say about the way that kids today are playing with toys versus the ways that we played as kids? And finally, our big question, what can we do to make American Girl great again? Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. Today's video is sponsored by Galaxy Lamps, creators of the gorgeous Galaxy Projector, a beautiful light that adds color and chill vibes to your room. The Galaxy Projector can light up any room with an array of countless rotating stars, and its integration with the Smart Galaxy Lamps app lets you choose custom colors, adjust rotation speed and brightness, set automatic timers, and control it with devices like Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa. Lately, I've been enjoying setting up the Galaxy Projector in my living room at night where I can chill with my dogs on the couch, maybe watch some TV, listen to some Christmas tunes, all while enjoying a beautiful display of colorful lights on my ceiling. If you're interested in trying Galaxy Lamps for yourself, head to my link in the description below, https colon slash slash galaxylamps.co slash savvywritesbooks to get your own Galaxy Projector 2.0. They're really fun for chill nights at home, and they could also make a great gift if you know anyone who wants to add some more light and color to their home. So thank you to Galaxy Lamps for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to our main topic. What's up, my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy. Welcome back to Savvy Writes Books, the channel where we talk about books and business work today. We are going to be talking about the evolution of a business through multiple book reviews, by which I mean, I think we're doing like eight or nine, maybe 10 book reviews in this video. So get pumped. We're going to be talking about a lot of books. If you're new here, please don't forget to subscribe because every week I put out new videos on these types of topics. I will be taking off the next two weeks for the holidays, but I will see you guys again in the new year. So this is the last video going out in 2023. I hope you guys enjoy. Before we get into the history of the American Girl Company, I want to give a quick thank you to my Patreon supporters whose names are listed up on the screen. Also, don't forget to check out the description below where you can check out my Patreon supporters who give $5 a month and up, who link their own small businesses or social media pages or whatever they want to promote down there as well. So thank you so much to my Patreon. The Origins of American Girl. American Girl was a brand first created by a former teacher and journalist named Pleasant Roland. As the legend goes, while Roland was shopping at the Big Marshall Fields in downtown Chicago, which was bought out by Macy's roughly two decades later, and is the very Macy's where I did my holiday fashion photo shoot for my merch brand. Check that out. Anyway, while she was at this particular store, she found a doll manufactured by the German company Goats, and she liked the craftsmanship of this doll. Unlike porcelain dolls, these dolls had a body and limbs that were made of vinyl and durable enough for kids to play with while also not just being made of cheap plastic, meaning that the doll could also be preserved as an eventual heirloom. Upon founding Pleasant Company, Pleasant Roland bought the rights to Goetz's Romina doll face mold, which became the basis for the American Girl doll classic mold, the mold used to create the faces of Samantha, Molly, Kirsten, Felicity, Kit, and more. But instead of keeping the dolls all vinyl body, Pleasant Company instead chose to follow one of Goetz's other dolls, the Somina doll, which had a cloth torso instead with vinyl limbs attached with strings. For the next roughly 10 years, American Girl dolls were manufactured by Goetz in West Germany, which is why many dolls. Like in the dress of this Kirsten doll right here, it has this tag right here that says manufactured in West Germany for Pleasant Company. Sometime in the mid 90s, manufacturing moved over to China, probably for cost efficiency reasons. Because of the implication. And nowadays, Pleasant Roland lives a mostly reclusive, retired life and rarely talks to the press, which is a shame because I'd really love to interview her probably more than like any other figure I can think of. Before. 
What implication? I relate to Pleasant Roland for many reasons. One, because we're both boss babes. Uh, two, because we both started up a company that pairs books with dolls, hers obviously being American Girl and mine being Forever Home Friends, which is my series of picture books and stuffed animals based on the stories of real rescue dogs and cats finding their forever homes. Link in description below. Other similarities between me and Pleasant Roland include both being from Chicago, both having worked as both teachers and journalists in the past, both having a deep love for toys, children's literature, and children's education despite having no children of our own, and and finally, both having first names that are generically positive adjectives. Pleasant, if you're watching this, DM me, hon, let's collab. That's probably the only time in my life that I will ever say something like that to an 82 year old woman. Now, I have a lot of American Girl dolls, like a lot. How many are there? Currently, I have 24. I actually have 25 in my house right now because I'm not counting Kaya yet because my dogs got me Kaya for Christmas as a gift, so I can't open her yet. I just know that Chewie got her for me as a gift because the surprise had to be ruined because he's a dog, so he had to use my credit card to buy her. Update as of me writing this script, I actually have 26 American Girl dolls in my house because while I was writing the script, my used Nelly doll from Mercari arrived, so that was exciting. Now, the overwhelming majority of these dolls I bought after the age of 25 with many of them being dolls that I bought used on Mercari, eBay, and Etsy in my late 20s and early 30s. Playing with American Girl dolls has somehow been more fun for me as an adult than it was as a kid, probably because as a kid I was poor for the first half of my childhood, so it was really, really special when my mom got me Molly for Christmas of 1999, which is now 24 years ago, because Molly was the doll who represented World War II, which is the era that my grandpa was from, and he'd recently passed away just a month before, and now I have a Molly tattoo! Too. And then when I got adopted at age eight, my dad bought me a Samantha doll and I was like, I'm experiencing class mobility. And now as an adult, I'm living the double income, no kids life and I can choose to spend my money however I want. So I can just buy a million dolls if that's what I want to do. And that's something I want to get into here as well. Do Generation X and Millennial doll collectors have an overall completely different experience of playing with American Girl dolls than the kids of today do? Are we just approaching the brand differently because we play with them differently. Now, as we explore this question throughout the video, we're going to be referring to a recent nonfiction book that was just published last month called Dolls of Our Lives. This book is written by Mary Mahoney and Allison Horrocks, hosts of the Dolls of Our Lives podcast, which if you ever catch me lifting weights and I have my earbuds in, it's probably what I'm listening to. Pump iron and play with dolls, that's how I live my life. Now, Dolls of Our Lives is a really fascinating book. Not only does it cover the history of American Girl and the way that the brand has evolved over generations, but it's also just like the most millennial book of all time. Millennials. Like this is a book for absolute millennials. And by absolute, I mean, you know how like generational lines are kind of squishy? Like when I was growing up, people used to tell me you're a millennial if you were born between 1980 and 2000. But then later people would tell me, no, millennials were actually born between 1976 and 1996. So I am Confucian. So there's always going to be this weirdness over like, okay, if you were born in 1998, are you a millennial or are you Gen Z? If you were born in 1979, are you a millennial or are you Gen X? Is someone born in 1997, a different generation from someone who's born in 1998, who's probably in the same class as them at school? All of those hard generational lines don't actually mean anything at the end of the day. Okay, a little too far, cross the line. But what I say this, I think most of us can agree that if you were born in the late 80s or the early 90s, there is no question you are 1000% as millennial as it gets. And that is who this book is for. Let's just look at how it starts in chapter one. As the immortal Sophia Petrillo, the oldest and best golden girl, might say, we want to take you back in time. Picture it. The year is 1995. William Bill Clinton is president of the United States. Monica Lewinsky is not yet known for her purse empire. Young girls are often seen carrying backpacks that are far too tiny to be useful, but also too adorable not to buy. The 1996 Olympics haven't happened yet. In other international affairs, a second revolution and British invasion is brewing and building to the release of Spice World. This book has Chris Fleming levels of synecdoche specifically for the absolute millennials. And if you're in your early 30s like I am, this book is just going to be fun as hell for you to read. The two authors of this book are, I think, like 36 or 37 years old, so they'd be a few years older than I am, but they largely had a very similar experience with American Girl Dolls as a child as I did, meaning an experience that took place largely in the late 90s. It was a deep spiritual journey. This book tells us a lot about the history behind the American Girl brand. 
One of the original goals behind the American Girl brand was specifically to make it different from Barbie. Now here's one small difference between myself and Miss Pleasant. I love Barbies and she hates them. But love Barbie or hate her, there's something to be said for creating a brand that's explicitly different from something that already exists, creating something that fills a market gap. You got gaps, I got gaps, together we fill gaps, I don't know. Barbies were first invented to give girls career aspirations, when most dolls of the time were either baby dolls meant for girls to LARP at being a mother, or army men targeted at boys to think about how fun going to war is gonna be. Barbies were different. Barbies were about imagining any possible future for yourself. But Pleasant Roland also thought we needed a doll who wasn't completely focused on the future. What about a doll who can make the past come alive, but connect the past with the present, the here and now, meet kids where they're at rather than trying to make them imagine what comes next? That that's why I love historical fiction, because it provides a vicarious experience. It's a way to hold on to the past, travel to a place you've never been, learn about a world beyond your own experience. As the book says on page 38 of Dolls of Our Lives, she never wanted her dolls to appear as adults or to be developed physically in any way beyond childhood. Unlike Barbie, who has the physical shape of an idealized thin white adult body, Pleasant would not entertain any notion of dolls for girls who did not appear to be girls themselves. She would also not allow talk of boys or makeup in a world designed for girls too young to care about such things. We'll talk in a minute about how the no talk of boys thing led American Girl Dolls to instead become queer icons. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, I can absolutely respect this vision, but I will also say by the time I was the age that these dolls were in their stories, which is nine to 10 years old for the trajectory of the original historical girls, I already had a full hourglass figure by that age. I already had tits for days. So a doll being not developed didn't necessarily resonate with me personally. I can, however, appreciate the fact that these dolls are blank slates, that their bodies are essentially rectangles, because it means that we can, first of all, swap the clothes among all the different dolls. Fashion show, fashion show, fashion show at lunch. The dolls are basically simulacra of human girls, not real models of them. They're not shaped or proportioned like any real human. Human. They're similar enough to evoke a feeling of emotional attachment to them, but they're also different enough so as not to be uncanny. And they're separate enough from reality that we're not going to project our own visions of our body onto theirs. The dolls aren't thin, nor are they fat, nor are they curvy, nor are they pear-shaped or anything else. They're all just generically doll-shaped, and they all can share clothes. And as a result, the dolls don't spend a lot of time thinking about their bodies, they don't spend a lot of time being hyper-aware of their appearance or how it manifests in a world that judges women based on their appearance. And in that way, these dolls normalize viewing girls and women as non-objectified, despite the dolls themselves being literal objects. I find that fascinating. Someone with a degree in philosophy, please comment with your thoughts below. I want to know what you think about all that. So Pleasant Roland took a trip to Colonial Williamsburg, a place that prides itself on creating an immersive historical experience for its guests. And she realized that she wanted to do something just like that, but with dolls, with books, place kids, specifically young girls, in the center of history so that they could imagine themselves fully immersed in the past, learning history through tactile play, learning history through immersion. I thought this was brilliant. I hated history class growing up, but let me tell you, I loved American Girl books. Which is why next, we're going into a review of the original American Girl books. The original American Girl books were for the most part written by a woman named Valerie Tripp, who is often remembered as Pleasant Roland's partner in crime. Now, I couldn't find all six books for every doll, so we're going to review some of the ones that I could find. With my luck, I'll find some of the missing books after I finish filming this. So we're going to review some of the original books for the original characters. Now, there is a debate within the American Girl fandom regarding who counts as an original character. Some say the original characters are the three released in 1986, the company's birth year, meaning the original characters are Molly, Samantha, and Kirsten. Others say the original characters are the ones that happened before Pleasant Company signed a deal selling themselves to Mattel. That means the original characters would be Molly, Kirsten, and Samantha from 1986, plus Felicity, Addie, and Josefina. Others would say that Kit also counts as an original character, even though she came out in 2000 and was, was released during the transitional period of Mattel ownership, but she still has a Pleasant Company neck engraving and her books still follow the same structure as the others. So I'm going with the broadest definition here because we absolutely have to include Kit in this. She's iconic. I can't not include 
include the writer doll in the originals. So we will be reviewing books from the following characters' collections. Felicity, a doll from the Revolutionary War. Josefina, a doll living in 1820s New Mexico before its U.S. territory. Kirsten, a Swedish immigrant to the U.S. during the 1850s. Addie, a formerly enslaved girl who finds freedom during the Civil War period. Samantha, an early 20th century orphan during early labor rights and suffragette movements. Kit, an aspiring journalist during the Great Depression. And Molly, a patriotic girl whose father is fighting in World War II. After we review all of these books, I want you all to let me know which of the dolls that you guys think are going to grow up to be the gayest. I think American Girl dolls have resonated with queer girls in the same way that like Elsa from Frozen does. A lot of people talk about Elsa being a lesbian icon because Disney never gave her a love interest in Frozen. So she was kind of a blank slate that we could project our own feelings onto. And I absolutely love that. Now, none of the American girls ever have any forms of romantic subplots at all. So we can all project which dolls are going to be lesbians, which which ones are going to be bi, which ones are ace, etc. I don't think any of them are straight, except maybe Mary Ellen, but I think she's actually just deep in the closet. Anyway, we are going to start with Meet Felicity, the book that caused the queer awakenings of horse girls all around America. This is Meet Felicity, the book right here. What's hilarious is that the first doll we're talking about today is one of the only dolls that I don't actually have. So we're going to have her mini doll right here with me while I discuss Felicity's book. Felicity's books are some of the most controversial books when we look back on them. As a white girl growing up in colonial Williamsburg in the 1770s, well, slavery was there in the background without really much being done to address it. Felicity's grandpa is stated to have owned a plantation, but there's never much examination that happens surrounding how plantations are run exactly. And Felicity's family is said to have servants and field hands working at their home, but the book never clarifies whether these workers are paid or whether they are enslaved. Felicity does have at least one black friend, so it does feel like the books are like trying to toe that line being like, okay, well, we don't want you to think of Felicity her herself as racist, but also she's in a time period that was a thousand percent racist as hell. So the whole thing is just kind of clunky and poorly handled in that way. And honestly, it kind of sucks that we're starting with Felicity because most of the books in the original characters collections are so good and so powerful and such a strong educational tool. And uh, Felicity's, in my opinion, are unfortunately by far the worst. We should also keep in mind that Felicity's collection, including her first book, was released in 1991. And if y'all remember the 90s, that was a time of centrism, radical centrism, being moderate was cool, all of that. I'm not saying that that's how individual people felt in the 90s. I'm saying that that's how the media portrayed things. TV shows, movies, books, everything tried so hard not to be political while also covering politically motivated topics that things ended up making basically no sense. I'm actually planning a video for 2024 about the show Seventh Heaven and how it represents some of the wildest 90s centrism and fence sitting that I've ever seen. And while I never thought of myself as the type of father who'd have to drug test his kids, I'm willing to do just that if that's what it takes to find out who brought a joint into this house. So in a lot of ways, Felicity here is a product of her time, both the time she exists in the 1770s and the time she was released in the early 1990s. When I opened up the book Meet Felicity to reference it for this video, I saw this doll hairbrush instructional guide that I'd been using in it as a bookmark when I was a kid. Like, okay, past savvy, how long has this been in here? Like 20 plus years? And also I definitely never brushed my doll's hair it. As the only thick, curly-haired person in my family, I found getting my hair brushed to be a thoroughly traumatic experience, and I was not going to subject my dolls to that. I do brush their hair now, though, except for not the dolls with curly hair. I don't brush theirs. Anyway, back to Felicity. In rereading Meet Felicity, the thing I remembered most from my childhood was the opening to this book. Felicity Merriman pushed open the door to her father's store and took a deep breath. She loved the smell of coffee, beans, and chocolate, of pine soap, spiced tea, and apples. No other place in the world smelled as good as her father's store. And I remember this because when I was a kid, these books inspired the lo a lot of the writing that I would start doing myself. And I definitely, as a result, wrote a bunch of stories about people whose parents owned stores just randomly. And then I would always have the stores opening with the character walking into their parents' door because in my mind, that's how this book started. So that was a very professional way to start a book. Anyway, while at her father's store, Felicity overhears talk of a man named Jiggy Nye who is abusing his horse. And Felicity is a horse girl to end all horse girls, okay? So she will not stay 
understand for this. In the second chapter, Felicity is at home working on practicing her handwriting, her script, and she's feeling super restless. Felicity doesn't like being stuck inside. She doesn't like having to do domestic duties when she wants to be outside riding horses. We get a sense early on that Felicity feels very limited by the gender roles that the 18th century is trying to force her into. On page 15, she helps her friend Ben make a delivery, and while they're out and about, she says, It's very tiresome to be a girl sometimes. There are so many things a young lady must not do. I'm told the same things over and over again. Don't talk too loud. Don't walk too fast. Don't fidget. Don't dirty your hands. Don't be impatient. Felicity and Ben go on a little excursion over to Mr. Nye's to see if the story about him abusing his horse is true, and they see it right there with their eyes. Mr. Nye is abusing this poor horse, and we even get a gorgeous illustration of it. Actually, the art in these original books is seriously top-notch. It's fantastic illustrations. So Ben makes a delivery to Mr. Nye, and Mr. Nye is pissed off that Felicity is catching him abusing his horse. So then they go home, and Felicity's mom tries to force her to start working on her stitching, and Felicity's like, no mom, sewing is boring. I'm a horse girl mom, it's not a face. This is not a game, this is my life. Then Felicity sneaks out of the house with her two siblings, convincing them to go and visit the horse that she's now obsessed with. Do you want a sugar cube? She starts feeding the horse sugar cubes, and Mr. Nye catches her and is like, girl, I told you to stop trespassing and to stop trying to steal my horse. And then at dinner, Felicity's siblings rat her out about going to see the horse, and her mom's like, I told you to stay away from Mr. Nye. He's a dick, so maybe you should also stop trying to steal his horse. Felicity's friend Ben speculates that Mr. Nye might end up killing the horse if he keeps it up, and Felicity begs her parents to buy the horse, and they're like, no, Felicity, we can't just go around buying horses. It's very reminiscent of like the kid who brings a puppy home that they find outside and they're like, mom, please, can we keep him? I promise I'll take care of the dog. And then it's like, no, Felicity, you're literally nine years old and you can't even sit still long enough to finish your stitching. No, we are not just buying you a random horse. So her parents make her promise to stop obsessing over the horse, but Felicity does not listen. Instead, she starts sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night before sunrise while everyone's asleep to go hang out with this horse whom she has named Penny. She also steals Ben's breeches to wear them while she's riding the horse and Ben's like, where are my pants? And Felicity's like, I don't know. And then she sneaks out and wears Ben's pants again to ride the horse. Eventually Ben catches her and he's like, girl, why are you stealing my pants? And she's like, because it's 1774 and they don't give me pants because I'm a girl and it's not easy to ride this horse in a long dress, so I took yours. And then Ben is really nice and covers for Felicity by saying he lent his good breeches to a friend. So Felicity's now sneaking out of the house, getting her siblings in trouble, making her friends lie for her. I think there's a reason that Felicity here remains one of the more controversial characters. This girl is absolutely chaotic. Anyway, Felicity's out all morning riding Penny one day, planning to steal the horse as usual, and Mr. Nye catches her and is like, hey, don't steal my horse. And then he starts hurling all these loud, angry insults at Felicity, and Felicity's dad sees this happening. And at first he's upset to find out that she's been, you know, sneaking out of the house every day for a month to play with a horse that she intends to steal. But then the dad hears Mr. Nye yelling and is like, excuse me, Mr. Nye, nobody's allowed to talk to my daughter that way. And then everyone agrees that Mr. Nye is way too cruel to be keeping a horse because they see Mr. Nye abusing the horse right in front of their eyes. But Felicity's parents are still like, we're not gonna buy the horse though. That's still not the solution. So Felicity and Ben once again, sneak out in the middle of the night one last time to set the horse free to run in the wild. It's a symbol of independence. That's why the last chapter is called Independence because the book is a symbol of American independence and the ability to run your country freely without the British ruling over you. It's nice from a literary perspective. It's very symbolic, but I can see why parents may not see Felicity as the best role model. Then we get the peek into the past section, which contains historical facts and explains how they tie into the story. I don't think I actually read any more of Felicity's books beyond this one, because again, I never had the Felicity doll and somehow I still don't. And I'm not really sure what to make of her as a person. Like, yeah, I can relate to her in some ways. I also can't sit still for long periods of time. I also go to big lengths when I want to help an abused animal. But man, this girl cares way more about animals than about people. She's regularly getting other people in trouble, making other people lie to cover for her. And also, as many have pointed out, including the hosts of the Dolls of Our Lives podcast, it is a little weird that Felicity cares so much about freedom and independence and making sure no one is ever abused, but literally never once even thinks about the concept of slavery, despite it happening Le legitimately right there all around her. Yeah, that's not a good look. So Felicity's book is, in my opinion, the worst of the original books. You are the weakest link.
Goodbye. Although it does have some awesome horse girl representation, I myself was not a horse girl. I was a dog girl, and I still am, but I get it. I get why people might like Felicity. We are now going to move on. We are now moving on to Josefina. We've got Josefina right here. Josefina is the first of the American Girl Dolls who is living on unofficial US territory at the time. She lives in New Mexico, but her story takes place in 1824, which is before the Mexican-American War happens and before New Mexico becomes part of US territory. So technically, Josefina is not living in the US, but to be fair, neither is Kaya, who came out in 2002 and is from the Nez Perce tribe in 1764 and is living on land that also does not yet belong to the US. What I find interesting about these historical books is that they're all tied together under this umbrella with this thread throughout them of being American, but they show that being American can take many different forms. Josefina and Kaya live on land that is now currently in present day American territory, but it wasn't at the time that their stories are taking place. Meanwhile, a girl like Kirsten is a Swedish immigrant and she immigrates to Minnesota. She learns to speak English and learns about how life is different than it was overseas. Then we have a character like Addie who always lives on American land, but is enslaved at the start of her first book and makes her way to freedom in Pennsylvania, a free state where she can gain citizenship and legally become recognized as an American. There are so many different ways to be an American girl. And I love how these historical books cover a wide range of those experiences. Josefina's collection was released in 1997 and with it premiered this new face mold, which is known as the Josefina mold, which is different from the previous classic rolled or the Goetz Romina doll mold from Germany. Josefina's mold is extremely popular and has since been used on other historical characters such as the 1910s doll Rebecca, the 1970s doll Julie, the doll for Samantha's best friend Nellie, and a bunch of the Girl of the Year collection, which is what we're gonna talk about later in the video. But that's all to say that Josefina was iconic from the moment of her release. Let's open her book and just read the first two pages real quick. Josefina Montoya hummed to herself as she stood in the sunshine waiting for her sisters. It was a bright breezy morning in late summer and the girls were going to the stream to wash clothes. Josefina's basket was full of laundry to be washed, but she didn't mind. She enjoyed going to the stream on a day like this. The sky was a deep, strong blue. Josefina wished she could touch it. She was sure it would feel smooth and cool. Josefina liked to stand just in front of her house, where the life of her papa's rancho was going on all around here. From here, she could smell the sharp scent of smoke from the kitchen fire. She could see cows and sheep grazing in the pastures. Yellow grass rolled all the way to the dark green trees on the foothills of the mountains, and the mountains zigzagged up to the sky. She could hear all the sounds of the rancho. Chickens clucking, donkeys braying, dogs barking, birds chirping, workers hammering, and someone laughing. The sound seemed like music to Josefina. The wind joined in the music when it rustled in the leaves on the cottonwood trees, and always under it all was the murmur of the stream. It sets us right there in the scene. It puts you right there with her in 1820s New Mexico. We we have a beautiful exposition right there engaging our five senses right from the start of the book. The opening scene involves Josefina and her three older sisters washing clothes by hand together outside. So we get a quick sense of what the average chores were like way back then. And the characters start reminiscing about their mother who unfortunately passed away a year ago. While they're out, the girls spot some primroses, which was their mother's favorite flower. So Josefina goes to pick some flowers to put in her memory box, which is a box that her great grandfather carved, a place where she keeps all of the old things of mamas to keep her memory alive. Then they get really excited because soon they're going to see their abuelito, who is a trader that runs a huge caravan from New Mexico to Mexico City, where he trades goods from all over the world. Apparently, abuelito is heading their way soon, and the girls are super pumped to see him. But then Josefina's sister is like, girl, there are some goats coming toward us, and Josefina is not happy because the head bitch of the goat herd, wh whose name is Floricita, is always ramming into everything and just being nasty all the time. So Josefina gets really scared about the goats and it turns out the Regina George of the goats, Floricita, wants Josefina's primroses that she got to remember her mom. Floricita rams right into Josefina and it hurts and then they get in a little tussle and fall into the creek together where Josefina ends up dropping all of her flowers. And the illustration is great. Josefina's stuck in the water and Floricita Sita is just munching away on those flowers without a care in the world. Then in the next chapter, the caravan comes. The girls are all so excited to see Abuelito and it turns out he's brought a surprise with him. Their mom's sister, Tia Dolores, who has traveled here from her home in Mexico City and is on her way to go live with Abuelito in Santa Fe. Josefina's older sister is like, dude, Tia Dolores is so cool. She is wearing all the latest fashions and Josefina's like, eh, she's kind of like an uncanny version of our mom though. Like she's our mom's sister. 
but she's not our mom. Like, our mom's prettier and cooler in every way, so I'm not really sure that I like her yet. And then Grandpa tells everyone a story that is so great that I just have to read it out loud to you word for word on pages 34 to 36. You see, he said, I was so glad that Dolores was going to come home with me. I finished all my business in Mexico City as quickly as I could. All went well until the day I came to Dolores' house to load up her belongings. Then the trouble began. He lowered his voice, pretending he did not want Tia Dolores to hear. I had forgotten how stubborn your Tia Dolores is. She is perhaps the most stubborn woman in the world. What did she insist that we bring? You'll never guess. Her piano! Amazed, all the girls repeated, her piano? Yes, said Abuelito. He was pleased to have astonished them all. Such fuss and trouble. I told her it was too heavy and too big, but she said she'd sooner leave all her other belongings than her piano. So I grumbled, but I allowed the piano to be packed and loaded onto one of my wagons. We left Mexico City, and I complained about the piano every mile of the way. He shook his head. Your tia Dolores never said a word. She just let me go on and on complaining. When we came to Dead Man's Canyon, you know what happened? What? asked the girls. Thieves, cried Abuelito in a voice so loud the girls jumped. Thieves attacked the caravan. Oh, you've never seen such a fight. Shouting, sword fights, gunshots. The wagon with the piano was just behind ours. We saw two thieves climb up on it and push the driver onto the ground. Then six or seven of our men rushed over and wrestled with the two thieves, trying to pull them off the wagon. With all the yelling and fighting, the oxen harnessed to that wagon were scared. They bumbled into each other, trying to get away. The wagon lurched forward right to the edge of a deep gully and then crash over it fell into the gully. The girls gasped. Abuelito put his hand on his heart. God bless us and save us all. What a sound that piano made when it fell, he said. A thud and then a hollow boom that rumbled like a musical thunder. It sounded like a giant hand had strummed all the keys in one stroke. The terrible sound that bounced off the walls of Dead Man's Canyon. It seemed to grow louder with every echo. The thieves were terrified. They never heard such a sound in all their lives. Well, didn't they take off as if they were on fire? All of them ran away as fast as their thieving legs could carry them. I'll bet they're still running. So the piano ends up saving the day. We love to see it. So Josefina's like, uh, can we see this piano? And Abuelito's like, no, it's still in the crate. That is way too much of a hassle. We got to set this piano up in Santa Fe and then you can come visit us and hear it then. And Papa is like, okay, but my kids have never heard someone play the piano before. And that's, it's pretty cool that you have a piano. So could you please just like play it for us since you're here? So they agree to just take a few boards off the wooden crate where the piano is and Tia Dolores kind of plays it a little bit through the crate. And these girls are like, oh yeah, that is a piano. Josefina is particularly in awe of how beautiful the piano sounds. And she decides that she now needs to do something for Tia Dolores to show her how thankful she is that she played the piano for her. The whole neighborhood is getting ready for a fandango and Josefina goes to prepare her gift for her aunt, a bouquet of her mom's flowers that she picked and arranged just for her. She decides to hide the flowers so they can be a surprise, but then, bet y'all know where this is going, that bitch of a goat Florecita eats the flowers again. So we know that Felicity over here is a horse girl, but Josefina is not a goat girl, okay? At least not yet. She loses her little mind when Florecita, she loses her little mind at Florecita and she tells that goat straight up to her face that she hates her. She literally says the words, I hate you to that goat's face three times. Then she drags the goat back into her pen and locks her there. Then she sees Tia Dolores who's like, what's wrong? And Josefina's like, I was gonna give you a beautiful bouquet as a gift, but then this bitch ass goat ate all the flowers and Tia Dolores is like, it's okay. I've got some seeds. We can plant these seeds together. I'll teach you gardening. It'll be a lovely experience. Dad rolls back up and he's like, is Florecita still loose? And Josefina's like, no, I put that bitch back in the pen. And dad's like, but I thought you were too scared of Florecita to handle her. And that's when Josefina realizes that she's overcome her fear. Then the girls all decide together that they want to ask Tia Dolores to stay with them instead of going back to Santa Fe with Abuelito. Tia Dolores decides she's going to leave her piano at their house. She's going to go with Abuelito temporarily to Santa Fe to visit the rest of her family there, but she promises to return as soon as possible and she's even left her piano there so we know she's coming back. At the end of the book, we get another peek into the past section of life in 1820s New Mexico, including how the space was still not U.S. territory yet, along with photos of what life would have been like around then. It's also worth noting that in future books, Josefina does become a goat girl and even ends up raising a little baby goat of her own named Sombrita, who you can get as part of Josefina's collection. Not anymore, you can't. But you could get her back in 1997. I might look for her on eBay because Sombrita is adorable. So y'all, when I was pulling out these books, I'm extremely stupid, right? And I pulled the books Meet Addie and Meet Kirsten aside like a year ago because I was planning to do a big video essay on American Girl Dolls like I'm doing right now. And then I procrastinated on the essay 
And then my office got messier and messier and messier. And now I can't find meet Kirsten or meet Addie. So I'm going to start by giving you guys a brief synopsis of Kirsten's series. And if you want more information on these, I highly recommend watching Babbity Kate's five hour long deep dive on everything involved with Kirsten, full in-depth reviews of all six of her books, videos of her creating Kirsten's craft, showing off her collections and her outfits, all of that fantastic video. I'll link it below. Anyway, Kirsten's books follow her life as an immigrant moving from Sweden to the U.S. in 1854. Her first book, Meet Kirsten, follows her time traveling by boat overseas and then traveling the rest of the way from New York to Chicago and eventually to Minnesota, where her aunts, uncles, and cousins already live. While on the boat, she meets a girl named Marta, and they become besties really quickly. They both have these rag dolls that they love playing with, and these two girls are constantly bonding, playing with their dolls, all during this voyage to America. But then one day there's a cholera outbreak on the boat and guess who gets cholera? That's right, it's Marta. Marta gets cholera and she fucking dies right there on the page and Kirsten is traumatized. Then she gets on another boat where her family's in the steerage class and Kirsten's like, uh, mom, why are we in the shitty part of the boat? And her mom's like, because first class is over there. And Kirsten's like, so why can't we pay to be on the nicer part of the boat? And her mom's like, oh my God, Kirsten just shut up already. Poor Kirsten has no knowledge of social socioeconomic class yet and she's just asking these questions in good faith and that's a common theme for Kirsten throughout these books she wants to ask questions and learn about the world around her but the adults are always just like oh my god Kirsten stop talking and do your farm chores already. So anyway, the family eventually gets to their new home in Minnesota. The second book, Kirsten Learns a Lesson, is all about Kirsten's experience starting school in Minnesota in a one-room schoolhouse with a really intense teacher named Miss Winston who is not afraid to beat the kids with a stick if they misbehave. And if a kid gets out of line, I got no problem smacking them in the head. She's also super racist against the indigenous people that are also living on the land right by them in Minnesota. Kirsten is struggling to learn English because she only speaks Swedish and her teacher is putting a lot of pressure on her to start doing her work in English. One day, Kirsten meets an indigenous girl named Singing Bird, and Singing Bird doesn't speak English or Swedish, so she and Kirsten become friends, and they bond over the fact that they can't communicate with anyone else or with each other, and they end up, like, creating their own little ways to communicate with each other amongst themselves, which is just lovely. I love Kirsten and Singing Bird's friendship. It's great. But then... Singing Bird's tribe has to leave. Due to all the new settlers from Europe in Minnesota, their family no longer has enough resources to survive, and Kirsten is like, shit, was this my fault? So she's having to deal with the guilt of being like, did I just steal my friend's land? And also dealing with the pain of her new best friend moving right after her previous best friend just died of cholera? Oh my god. I just want to give Kirsten a hug. Actually, I have the doll. I think I am going to give her. Kirsten, you you need a hug. Oh my god. None of the adults were ever emotionally available for Kirsten during her formative years. This girl is going to have so much to unpack in therapy. I love that in all of the second books in the series, they're all about how the character learns a lesson. Like, Kirsten learns a lesson. That The characters always have to learn two lessons that intersect with each other. First, a lesson at school. Second, a lesson about the greater context of the world that they're living in. Kirsten Kirsten has to learn to speak English, but she also learns what it means to be part of different cultures. What it means for her to struggle to speak the language that her classmates can speak while being able to speak Swedish at home with her family, while also struggling to speak with Singing Bird, and then struggling with the cultural differences between her own families, her family and their Swedish heritage, her school and their new American heritage, Singing Bird and her indigenous heritage, all of those cultural differences, and then the guilt that that ultimately causes her when Singing Bird leaves. But also, fuck Miss Winston, that abusive racist bitch. I do not like that teacher. Anyway, Kirsten, we, we love and support you. Since I can't find the book Meet Addie, like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to give a brief summary of that book, and then we're going to review Addie's Christmas book in full. That's going to be fun. Addie's first book, Meet Addie, opens with Addie and her family living under slavery. Addie has an older brother, Sam, and a baby sister, Esther, and from the beginning, this book is trauma. We learn that Addie's older brother, Sam, once tried to escape from slavery and he got caught and was pretty heavily tormented as punishment. Addie learns of the Underground Railroad and that her family is planning to follow it to find a path to freedom. Addie is extremely scared because, well, if her family gets caught, they could get punished, they could get put back into slavery, or they could even be separated from one another forever. It is without a doubt that Addie's books have by far the highest stakes of any of these books. So anyway, the family makes a plan to try to 
get all the way to Philadelphia, far away from the plantation where they are currently stationed. We actually do see Addie working as a slave in this book. And I think a lot of people remember from their childhood some of the scenes from this part of the book because they are particularly traumatizing. Addie has some very nasty encounters with Master Stevens, the man who runs the plantation, including a scene of Addie catching Master Stevens tying up her older brother with plans to sell him, and Addie herself being whipped when she doesn't listen to his instructions. The following chapter has Addie dealing with the trauma of her father and brother being sold to another slave owner, and it only gets worse. I think this particular scene is the one that stuck with a lot of people. Addie isn't focused on her work because she's still so sad about her dad and brother being forcibly separated from the family, but the plantation overseer wants to punish Addie for not doing her work. So as a punishment, he forces her to eat live worms in front of him while she chokes and gags on them. The rest of the book then features Addie and her mother traveling through the Underground Railroad to reach safe houses and eventually to get to Pennsylvania where they can be free citizens. I'd actually forgotten this part of the book until I looked up some stuff about this book on the American Girl Wiki when I was preparing for this video, but Addie and her mother actually end up leaving Addie's younger sister Esther behind. They're worried that if she cries, since she's just a baby, if she starts crying, it might give them away, they might end up getting recaptured, so they end up leaving Esther with Addie's aunt and uncle, and they're pretty sure no one's gonna try to sell Esther into slavery because she's a baby so she can't work yet but everyone's still understandably extremely stressed about all of this. Eventually after a series of difficult obstacles Addie and her mother reach the safe house and Miss Caroline a white woman who's helping enslaved black people escape and when they reach her home they realize that they have made it. The ending of the book is bittersweet because they still haven't been reunited with Addie's father or brother. We are now going to read the Christmas book from Addie's series Addie's Surprise which is fitting because it's almost Christmas Christmas time and as a result I have my Addie doll dressed up in the dress that she wears in this book. All right let's go. The premise of Addie's surprise is that Addie is understandably worried about having to experience her first Christmas without her siblings or her dad and to be there for her mom, she decides to buy her mom a red scarf as a gift to cheer her up. But of course, as tends to happen in these books, Addie will have to learn about the value of gifts beyond those that are material. So let's review Addie's surprise. Our story opens Our story opens on a wintry day in Philadelphia where Addie and her mother live. Addie's mom is currently working as a seamstress for Mrs. Ford, a local shop owner, and Addie is earning some money as well by doing deliveries for Mrs. Ford's shop. Addie saves up her wages and tips in a little milk bottle that she and her mom are using to save up money to buy a lamp for their home. Addie also starts worrying what her little sister Esther's Christmas is going to be like without her, and she starts really missing her brother and dad as well. Addie has made a friend from school, a girl named Sarah, and Sarah tells Addie all about what celebrating Christmas is like in Philadelphia, where they have this big church service and a huge celebration with all these decorations, and Addie's actually starting to look forward to Christmas now. On the weekend when Addie's out doing some deliveries for Mrs. Ford, she decides to stop by a secondhand shop at the shop she sees this gorgeous red scarf and she realizes that she could save up her tips from delivering dresses to buy her mom the scarf for Christmas. The scarf costs 20 cents and Addie is stressed about having to save up this much money. Fun fact, the American Girl books are where I first learned about inflation. Regularly in these books, the characters will say how much money something costs, often in reference to that thing being extremely expensive. And in my head as a kid, I was like, okay, 20 cents? That's nothing. And then through talking about these books with my mom while we were reading them together, I learned that the value of a dollar changes over time. Funnily enough, a lot of people complain about American Girl dolls being too expensive today, saying that they're so much more expensive than they were back in my day. But but the dolls are actually currently the cheapest that they've ever been. A doll and book on an American Girl site currently retails for $115 in 2023 money. And if we put that into the inflation calculator from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that means that in 1986, if the dolls were to cost the same amount, they would cost $41. But in 1986, the dolls did not cost $41. They cost $68. <laughs> $68 in 1986 is equivalent to $187 in 2023 money, so the dolls are actually significantly cheaper than they used to be. And these books are where I first learned of the entire concept, that's fun. Now the US Bureau of Labor Statistics calculator only goes back to 1913, so I couldn't find out how much 20 cents was equivalent to in 1864 money, but in 1913 money 20 cents was equivalent to about six of today's dollars, so it was also probably significantly more than that. So Addie gets the secondhand shop 
shop owner to agree to hold the scarf for her until she can earn 20 cents making deliveries. In the milk bottle at home, Addie and her mom are putting all their wages, saving up for their lamp, and Addie has started also keeping her tips for herself, not really for herself, but saving them so that she can afford to buy her mom this gift. The next day, Addie's at church, and the reverend gives a sermon about this concept of freedom isn't free, during which he talks about how there's a bunch of formerly enslaved, newly freed people that are coming over to Philadelphia, and they're trying to get on their feet, and they need financial help, and as a result, Reverend Drake has set up a collection drive to help them. Addie's mother decides that they should give the money that they're saving in their milk jug to the church, because she remembers how tough it was for them when they first arrived here, and they were just starting to get on their feet. Addie doesn't want to tell her mom about the extra money that she's been saving, because she wants that gift for her mom to be a surprise, so she decides, okay, I can help these people by volunteering my time instead of giving money. And then the next chapter has another scene that I clearly remember from childhood. Addie's volunteering down at the pier to meet people when they first come off the boat. She sees this woman carrying a bundle with a baby inside. The woman and the baby both look cold, so Addie goes up to them and wraps the baby in her shawl and offers to carry the baby for this woman. The baby seems happy that Addie is carrying her, and the baby's mother says, she like you. She don't take a shine to just anybody. And then later on the page says, we coming up from Baltimore. And when I was seven years old, I had just never heard anyone talk that way before because at the time my entire family was white. I didn't really have a lot of friends in general. And that's how my little white self learned what AAVE was or African American Vernacular English, even though I don't think we called it that then or I don't think I knew it by that name for a few years after. But at least that's how I learned that different communities might have different linguistic dialects and that a lot of black communities have their own dialects elective English that is different from the way I as a white child was used to hearing. I even remember asking my mom about it, asking why does she say she like you? Wouldn't it sound better for her to say she likes you? And my mom explained to me, not in these words exactly, but that people who are come from different communities end up speaking differently because their language forms differently. I don't think she used the words linguistic dialect, but th that's how I first learned of this concept in general. It's really amazing how rereading that scene just unlocked that memory. And it's actually weird that it was this particular scene that unlocked this memory, because as far as I know, Addie and her mom have been speaking in AAVE throughout the entire book so far, so I don't know why it was that scene that stuck out to me when I was a child, but memories are weird. I don't know. That's what happened. Anyway, back to Addie's story. So Addie makes a delivery to a wealthy family and gets a whole dime as a tip, so she is ready to go and buy the scarf for Mama. But then she thinks about the baby that she just held, how that baby reminds her of her own little sister, and how she's worried that those people might not have enough money to survive. So Addie walks past the store, and instead of buying the scarf, she puts her dime in the collection box from church. Then, when Addie is waiting for her mom at work, the wealthy woman who'd received the dress delivery, she comes in super pissed off at Mrs. Ford saying, this dress is way too small. You did a shit job on this. You did not make it the right size for me. And Mrs. Ford, good boss that she is, defends Addie's mom and says, uh, no, she did not make the dress wrong. She's the best seamstress I've ever had. We love and respect Ruth Walker in this house. So Mrs. Ford gives the annoying lady a refund and then she's sad because how can someone be so rude to workers during Christmas time? I wish I could say things have gotten better on that front in the past century and a half, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, we still have a world full of Karens. So on Christmas Eve, Addie makes her last delivery, and then Mrs. Ford gives Addie a gift. It's the dress that rude Karen didn't want. Mrs. Ford decides to give the dress to Addie because Addie has been so helpful to her in her shop. It is uh, this exact dress right here. So Mrs. Ford has to hem the dress a little bit for it to fit Addie. So Addie comes up with a great idea. She's going to take the excess fabric that Mrs. Ford takes from the dress, and then she uses that fabric to make the scarf for her mom. Now she has a gift to give her mom for Christmas. I was already getting chills at just how sweet this was when I was rereading this book, but believe it or not, it gets even better. Everyone goes to church for the Christmas celebration, and while they're there during the nativity play, guess who shows up? It's Addie's dad! He makes it home for Christmas! Unfortunately, he's been separated from Addie's brother Sam, and her sister Esther is still living with their aunt and uncle. But at the end of the book, Addie's father vows to find a way to reunite their family as soon as possible, which of course will happen before the end of Addie's six book series. I absolutely love Addie's books, and I think they provide not just an excellent historical context for the Civil War era and the atrocities that Black Americans faced at that time, but they also provide a look at what rebuilding life was like after escaping from slavery and the difficulties of starting a new life when financially you're starting from nothing. But on top of that, we see Addie's excitement for all things Christmas, for the church celebration, for eating all the food that the church is preparing, for spending time with her friends and family. Addie's collection was first released 
in 1993, and Addie was the first non-white doll released by the brand. The brand, as a result, created a new face mold for her, referred to as the Addie Mold. This is her face. And surprisingly, no other dolls have used this face mold since her. I mean, you can get like the Truly Me line, the unnamed dolls with Addie's mold, but there are no other historical characters with Addie's face mold. The other three dolls that represent Black girls, Cecile, Melody, and Claudie, all have a different face mold from Addie's. Cecile and Melody have the same face mold, the Sonali mold, but Claudie has a new mold that was invented in 2022. Anyway, the point is, much like Josefina, Addie brought along a lot of new components to the American Girl collection. And because Addie was the first doll of color in the series, her books had a lot of discussion surrounding them. How would this company handle a topic as sensitive as slavery? Would the books use the N-word? What level of violence was acceptable to show children? How could they tell a story that would be historically accurate while also being empowering to young Black girls rather than traumatizing to them? Slate published an article in September of 2016 titled The Making of an American Girl, written by Aisha Harris, which details Pleasant Company's development process for the doll. As the article explains, for almost two decades, generations of young Black girls turning to the American Girl series of stories for about characters who looked like them had only one choice. Addie Walker, a nine-year-old girl born into slavery who, in the accompanying books, eventually escapes to freedom alongside her mother. Ever since she arrived as the fifth doll in the company's incredibly successful collection of mail-order dolls, Addie has been a polarizing figure, revered by many as an inspiring character and an important educational tool and criticized by others as a vehicle for wallowing in Black suffering. Pleasant Company in the early 90s was overwhelmingly white. Perhaps because of this, Roland put together an advisory board of Black scholars and historians to advise on Addie's creation. This was an unusual step. While all the historical dolls have been developed with the assistance of outside experts to ensure accuracy, Addie was the first doll to have a more formalized advisory board. The board was an impressive assembly of Black intellectuals. Lonnie Bunch, who then served as an educator and longtime curator at the Smithsonian, Cheryl Chisholm, who was a film producer and director of the Atlanta Third World Film Festival, Spencer Crew, who was also a curator and historian at the Smithsonian, Violet Harris, an expert on children's literature and Black American children's literature in particular, Wilma King, a historian and expert on American slavery, June Powell, then of the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center in Ohio, and Janet Sims Wood, who was a librarian and scholar at Howard University and specialized in the stories of Black women. According to Polly Athen, who served as Pleasant Company's in-house research coordinator, it was the board that made the decision to set Addie's story amid the end of slavery and the Civil War. Though the board also discussed placing her in other periods, including the Harlem Renaissance, the members' thinking was that slavery was the foundation for everything that came after it and must be tackled first in order for children to understand more recent history. Athens' job was to make sure everything, from Addie's hoop earrings down to her black lace-up boots, was historically accurate, and the board spent more than a year critiquing the prototypes of the dolls as well as the book manuscripts. According to Harris, the group met periodically for all-day meetings, usually in Washington, D.C., to hash out content and make suggestions, each bringing their own knowledge and background to the project. Roland was involved in every step of the process and present at every meeting. So, Pleasant Company ended up hiring author Connie Porter to write Addie's books, and Connie Porter brought a great deal of experience to the table along with her own vision of how she thought Addie could be brought to life. As Harris details in the Slate article, Porter and the board also stressed that the story should be one of empowerment, even if it began in slavery. Everybody agreed that it had to be a story of a self-authorized flight to freedom, Chisholm said. We were all very concerned that the experience of slavery not be whitewashed. One thing Chisholm recalls crusading hard for was Addie's cowrie shell necklace. The cowrie shell, as she points out, holds ritual significance among some West African cultures. There was also another sensitive subject that the board debated carefully, the inclusion of the N-word in the books. Initially, there was some disagreement between the board and Porter. I thought that it belonged in the book. I had put it in the book, and I was convinced that it belonged in the book, she said. But the board was concerned about the effects that seeing the word would have on such a young target audience, especially considering the many other troubling aspects of slavery that they would already be processing. Beyond that, they had to consider the environments in which the books would be read. They thought about the black child in an all-white school, the white teacher at an all-black school, and so on. Harris said she worried whether schools that assigned the book would be prepared to lead those discussions in a fashion that could be 
both honest and empathetic. Bobby Johnson held similar concerns. It's different with kids as young as seven and eight, she said. Plus, she worried that the word would keep the book out of school curriculum and on lists of banned books alongside the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Ultimately, Porter came around and was convinced that the other language she used to convey the dynamic between Master Stevens and Addie and her family, accompanied by the illustrations, was sufficient to convey slavery's horrors. This article as a whole is just really good. There's a lot more fantastic stuff in there. I highly recommend it. I will link it in the description below so that you can read the whole thing. I also think it's really cool that they now also have a Harlem Renaissance doll, Claudie, who's one of my absolute favorite dolls, and we are going to talk about her in depth as well later in this video. But for now, we are going to be moving forward into the doll that a lot of people consider kind of the queen of the American Girl dolls, and that is Miss Samantha Parkington of 1904. Samantha's book, Meet Samantha, opens with her climbing a tree while her neighbor, this annoying ass kid named Eddie, bullies her and calls her stupid. He has this line which stuck with me all throughout my childhood where he said, you're so dumb, you probably think three times four is 12. And then Samantha says, Eddie, three times four is 12. And anyway, uh, that's where I first learned that three times four was 12. I was in first grade when I read this book and I hadn't learned multiplication tables yet. So that was the first place I'd ever heard it. Thank you for that, Samantha. Thank you for teaching me math. Throughout this book, we learn that Samantha is a bit of a lovable misfit. She comes from a wealthy family with multiple maids and cooks, but Samantha isn't so great at being a proper young lady. She climbs trees and tears her stockings. Sometimes she leaves jelly biscuits lying out and then ants will come to eat them. Now, Samantha lives with her grandma, whom she calls Grand Mary, because both of her parents unfortunately died in a horrible boat accident a few years ago. Samantha loves her favorite uncle, Uncle Guard, who we also learn is dating a woman named Cornelia. Samantha thinks Cornelia is kind of interesting, but she also isn't sure she wants Uncle Guard to settle down and get married just yet because she thinks he's cool enough to be a spy. Samantha has a very active imagination and she likes to talk a lot and we learn that this often gets her in trouble. In chapter two, Uncle Guard arrives bringing his girlfriend Cornelia with him and Grand Mary is annoyed that Uncle Guard drove here in an automobile because she thinks that these newfangled automobiles are just super annoying. And then from that insufferable neighbor kid, Eddie, Samantha learns that a new girl is coming to the neighborhood. Her name is Nellie and she's going to live at Eddie's house. Samantha meets Nellie outside the next day and this this is where Samantha learns of child labor. So we're going to read this exchange on pages 22 to 23. Are you Nellie? She asked brightly. The girl looked surprised and very timid. Yes, miss, she answered without stopping her work. Eddie had said Nellie was nine, but this girl seemed smaller than Samantha. Are you visiting the Rylands? asked Samantha. This time Nellie looked amused. Oh no, miss, I'm working here, she said. Samantha was surprised. Eddie hadn't said a girl was coming to work. But it didn't matter. Samantha thought it would be wonderful to have a friend right next door. She remembered the cookie in her hand. Would you like some gingerbread, she asked. It's just baked. Nelly looked at the Rylands house. Oh no, miss, I can't. Won't they let you, asked Samantha. No, I don't think so, miss. I've got my job to do, Nelly answered. My name's Samantha. You don't have to call me miss. Samantha put her cookie and napkin down on a stone and reached for a piece of wet laundry. I'll help you, Nelly. Then we can play. Oh, no, you shouldn't, Nellie said. She was embarrassed, but there's nothing she could do to stop her new friend. So instead, she hurried to finish the job before anyone could see Samantha working. When the last of the laundry was hung, Samantha grabbed Nellie's hand and pulled her toward the tunnel. We can eat in here. Nobody will see us, Samantha said. The girls just fit into the hole in the hedge, and Nellie couldn't say no to the smell of spicy gingerbread. Why are you working here? Samantha asked between bites. Nellie didn't look at Samantha when she answered. My father works in a factory in the city, and my mother does washing. But there's three of us children, you see, and it's not enough, she added quietly. There wasn't enough food, and there wasn't enough coal. Samantha learns that Nellie doesn't go to school because she's working all the time. And this is also where I, as a child, learned about child labor. My little seven-year-old brain had never fathomed the concept before. So Samantha's like, Nellie, I got you. I'm going to teach you to read, okay? Because it's not fair that you don't get to go to school just because you're poor. Samantha is truly a class-conscious icon. One of the people who works for the Parkington family, Jessie, who I believe is the family's maid, ends up leaving abruptly one day. And Samantha really wants to figure out what made Jessie quit. So Nellie tells Samantha that because one of her tasks is fetching tea for Eddie's mom, she learned where Jessie lives along the way. So Samantha and Nellie are about to go do a little bit of stalking as a treat. This is also where we learn about how everything is racially segregated. Jessie is a black woman, and as a result, Samantha and Nellie have to go to a different part of town where white people don't live. And Samantha's also kind of surprised by this. I love how Nellie is just point by point popping Samantha's privileged bubble, and Samantha is basically 
basically open to learning everything. Samantha and Nellie are then just chilling outside Jesse's house, looking in the windows, being general creeps. When Jesse's husband catches them and is like, what are you guys doing? They explain that they're worried about Jesse because she left so abruptly. And Jesse's like, oh, I didn't realize you guys were worried about me. And it turns out the reason she left is because she had a baby. So then she introduces them to her new baby, Nathaniel. I'm pretty sure this is the first place I ever learned the name Nathaniel to. Samantha and Nellie feel good about this. But then the next day, Eddie is back to being a general asshole. Here's what Eddie says on page 48. You're not going to believe this. Nellie's going away, Eddie said. Samantha felt as though she'd been hit. What are you talking about, Eddie? Our driver's taking her back to the city. She's sick, and my mother says she's not strong enough to work. She's waiting in the kitchen. Mother says next time we'll get an immigrant woman who can last longer. What the fuck, Eddie? Fuck you, Eddie! So now Samantha's terrified because she knows that if Nellie gets sent back, she's going to have to go work in the factory. So this book ends with Samantha asking her uncle guard and her soon to be aunt Cornelia and her grand Mary for all to help her in getting Nellie back. The future books will then delve into the ways that Samantha has to rescue Nellie from the factory and give a speech to her school about the evils of child labor and the importance of protecting workers. What goes around comes around, Eddie. And then I'm pretty sure at some point Nellie's parents end up dying of like scarlet fever too, but I'm, I don't remember for sure. Everything turns out okay. I ordered a Nelly doll on Mercari, which I'm not opening until Christmas because I have to save some surprises for myself. But guys, these can't be the original American Girl dolls, can they? Remember when American Girl dolls weren't political? Remember when they taught classical values that today's conservative influencers would agree with? What's this doll Samantha from the very first release in 1986? What the fuck is she doing learning about workers' rights and class division? Fuck you, Eddie! Wait until they find out that Aunt Cornelia is a suffragette. But guys, this can't be real, can it? Remember when the American Girl dolls used to teach us traditional values, like traditional femininity? Well, now they've gone woke. Gone are the days when American Girl taught girls about history and femininity. Now they're encouraging our daughters to hate their bodies and cut off their breasts in the name of self-love. Return your American Girl Christmas gifts ASAP. Well, Ellie Beth Stuckey, let me introduce you to Kit. It's Kit, Kit. So this doll was released almost 24 years ago, and according to your bio, Allie Beth Stuckey, you and I were born in the same year, meaning that you also would have been eight years old when she came out, so you could have had Kit as a child. Kit is probably one of the traditionally feminine dolls that you're personally nostalgic for, right? Kit? With her short hair? Who has a gender-neutral chosen name? That's right, her assigned name at birth is Margaret Mildred, but she prefers to go by the gender-neutral name Kit, which is what we all remember her as. She also plays baseball with the boys outside, she has multiple friends who are homeless, and when she's first faced with the realities of the Great Depression, she suggests taxing the rich as a viable solution. Badass, 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 badass. Kit is literally the archetype of the woke leftist that you're afraid of, and she's been here since you yourself were an American Girl's target audience. So let's talk about Kit. Kit is a nickname for Margaret Mildred Kittredge, and she is a girl who loves to write. She just loves tippity-tapping away on her typewriter, but the Great Depression is on the horizon. So to save money, Kit's family ends up turning their home into a boarding house where people can rent out rooms. And Kit decides to power her way through the Great Depression by writing about it on her typewriter, kicking off her future career as a reporter. In addition to Kirsten and Samantha, the other doll released in the initial launch was Molly. A girl from 1944 living through World War II. Molly's the one I have a tattoo of right here. She was the doll that my mom got me for Christmas of 1999. I love this girl with all my heart and her books have always been among my favorites. In Meet Molly, the book starts off with Molly being pissed off about World War II rations because she does not want to eat turnips. And I can respect that. Again, just because these girls are living through massively influential historical periods does not mean that they're not still kids first above all else. We learn that Molly's dad is off in England where he's working as a doctor helping wounded soldiers during the war. And we learn that Molly's mom is now working for the Red Cross and that Molly and her siblings are stuck at home eating gross ass turnips. Molly misses her dad a lot. And eventually Molly's mom gets home from work and she offers to add just a little bit of butter and cinnamon to the turnips, but not too much because, you know rations. So that's super nice of Molly's mom, all things considered, and Molly finally eats the turnips. Now what I remember most about Molly's first book is how much Molly and her older brother Ricky antagonize one another. For example, on page 23 of Meet Molly, 
We get this scene where Molly and her friends are trying to figure out their Halloween costumes, but Ricky's being super annoying about it. You'd be perfect as the three little pigs, said Ricky, or you could be the three bears, or how about the three stooges, or the three kings of Orient? He began to sing in a loud, teasing voice. We three kings of Orient are, tried to smoke a rubber cigar. It was loaded, it exploded. Stop it, yelled Molly. And suddenly Ricky did stop. Yeah, not gonna lie, I laughed at the scene like a goddamn hyena when I was a kid. I think that might have been why I liked Molly's book so much. They really made me laugh. Molly and her brother were so real as characters, the way they constantly tormented each other in such annoying and frustrating ways, but also in such natural, playful, and sibling-like ways. On Halloween, Molly and her friends have a lovely time trick-or-treating, but on the way home, stupid Ricky blasts them all with a hose, and Molly's like, Ricky, I'm gonna get you back. So chapter four is called War, but it's not about the actual war going on, you know, the actual World War II, but it's about the war between Molly and Ricky as these two prank each other to death. Molly finds out that Ricky has a crush on their older sister's best friend, and she's like, all right, I'm gonna fuck this up for him. So when this girl's outside the house, Molly grabs Ricky's dirty laundry and dumps his dirty socks and underwear on this girl's head. And Molly's like, ha ha, now the girl you like is covered in your dirty socks and underwear and then the girl Ricky likes laughs in his face and Ricky's like Molly I swear I'm gonna get you back for this Ricky and Molly then declare war on each other and their mom overhears this and is like hell no this is not war war is what your father's fighting over in England you two need to chill on page 50 their mom says this I suppose these tricks you've been playing on each other don't seem very serious to you, but they are mean, childish, and wasteful. I'm disappointed in you, but more than that, I'm sad and discouraged. If we can't get along together, who can? This fighting has to stop. This is exactly what starts wars. This meanness, anger, and revenge. Two sides decide to get even and end up hurting each other. There's war and fighting enough in the world, and I won't have any more of it in our house. Is that understood? And I was like, okay. Great job creating the literary symbolism there, Valerie Tripp. Good job making your point and having the mom have a mic drop moment. But I also think that there's a little bit more to World War II than meanness, anger, and revenge. I'm not sure I'd call World War II two sides decide to get even and end up hurting each other. I think World War II had pretty clear aggressors and victims. I get what you're going for, Mrs. McIntyre, but it just didn't land with me, not as an adult at least. In the later books, Molly's gonna make a friend named Emily. Emily's from England, and Emily's gonna get really annoyed at Molly for playing bomb shelter. Because Molly is unhinged. I think Molly's probably the biggest nuisance of the entire book. We've got Josefina, who's just this sweet and quiet girl who's trying to learn how to stand up to a goat while she's mourning her mother's death. And then we get Molly, who's literally starting a prank war with her brother while complaining about how shitty the World War II rations are and making bomb shelter into a game. Molly is at least a realistically written immature child. I will give her that. I'm also realizing that out of these original characters, for the most part, the white girls have no chill. Like, Molly is a nuisance. Samantha's out here stalking people, sneaking out at night. Felicity's throwing her friends under the bus, lying about people, stealing horses. All of them except Kirsten. Kirsten seems like a kind and empathetic kid. And it seems to be a white girl thing because Josefina and Addie are so giving and kind. When we look at Kit, like, Kit's kind of feisty, but she's not really that bad. Molly, Samantha, and Felicity, these girls lack any sense of shame. I also think that it's really funny that whenever I talk about American Girl doll nostalgia, a lot of people bring up to me that Molly was their favorite as a child because she was the nerdy one. Which is absolutely wild to me because no the fuck she was not. Molly never does a single nerdy thing throughout the entire series. Molly's a goofball who never knows when to take things seriously and she's also kind of whiny but she eventually learns to be patriotic. That's Molly's arc. I'm not sure Molly ever even reads a single book. If anything, I'd say Josefina's the closest thing we have to the nerdy one out of the original girls. She's very quiet and introspective. She loves flowers and pianos. You can make an argument for Kit being the nerdy one because she's a writer, but Molly? Definitely not. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Why does everyone remember Molly as the nerdy one? Is it solely because she has glasses? Are her glasses the only thing people remember about her? Keep in mind that in addition to these books, American Girl also published a series of nonfiction, self-help style books for tweens. I've actually reviewed a few of them on this channel before. Those include The Care and Keeping of You, which is how a significant number of millennials learn to put tampons in, and Money Makers, the book on how to be a boss babe that I've also reviewed on this channel, along with the series The Smart Girl's Guide, which covers covered topics like school, friendship, sports, and more. A lot of these books are pretty good for their time, but they're also outdated in a few ways, especially when they try to talk about the internet, which can be super funny to roast. But what I love about all of these books is that there's this common thread of it showing what it means to be a kid. 
Felicity is nine years old during the American Revolution. She knows of the political conflicts going on around her regarding British rule of the colonies versus American desire for independence, but Felicity's not physically fighting in the war. She's a kid, and while she does have to know that those pieces of life are going on around her and those do influence what happens, she also experiences normal kid things that we would experience as kids too, like not wanting to do her chores or being annoyed when her mom tells her no to something. Kirsten goes through a ton of trauma, from leaving her home country with no plan of ever returning, to watching her best friend die of cholera, but Kirsten's also a kid. She wants to play with her rag doll. She doesn't understand the class differences that lead her into a less desirable part of the ship. Even a character like Addie, who most of us can agree probably has the highest stakes of any of these dolls, is still a kid. She's excited about learning to read. She likes getting new toys. She likes having her doll. She likes having a new dress. She's focused first and foremost on the connections that she fosters within her own family. That's the essence of what American Girl truly was. A series of books that helped you understand history and your own place in it. By being able to see the ways that a character like you would have navigated life in another time period. And through tactile play and engagement, the books never felt educational. You had a doll to go along with it to bring that book to life so that you could touch and feel the way your doll's hair is styled. You could dress your doll in outfits that she likely would have worn in that time period. You could reenact those periods of history with your doll. And then in 1995, Pleasant Company released its first set of contemporary dolls at that time called American Girl of Today, but currently what we call the Truly Me dolls. These dolls had no stories that came along with them, no connections to any specific time period. They were yours to do with as you wished. And they came with these... You could write your own book for the doll following the six book format that the other dolls had and y'all these were such a fantastic resource for helping kids get invested in writing. This outfit makes me feel like it's 2003 and I'm about to go perform with Pink Slip at the House of Blues. I love it. All right, 90s kids, who's ready for the most niche throwback of all time? Who remembers? These! Who remembers these? These blank books that you could get to write the stories of your own American Girl doll. My grandma used to find blank versions of these at garage sales that people hadn't filled out yet and just buy them for me so that I could write my own stories about my dolls. I was very inspired by Kirsten's friend Marta dying of cholera, so oftentimes I'd make my friend's dolls die and I'd make them have to get over it really quickly too. I don't know what that says about me as a kid. Anyway, today throughout this video we are going to be writing writing the story of a new doll together. Let me go get her. Here she is. This is Charlotte. Charlotte is uh, my version of the girl of the year 2024. I announced her back in January of 2023, way back at the beginning of this year. I know there is an official girl of the year 2024. Her name is Lila. She's extremely mid, even her horse is mid, and I cannot get over that. But this is the girl of the year 2024 that I originally announced back in January. This is Charlotte. She goes by Charlie for short, and she is a 13 year old girl in seventh grade. She is transgender, and she wants to be an athlete. So this is our trans female athlete doll that the conservatives are very afraid of because I figured American Girl needs to go big or go home. And we are going to get a little bit into the specifics of the politics behind all of that and the messages in these books. But I thought today as part of this video together we could all write Charlie's six book series like the original Pleasant Company six book series right here in these. So, uh, Charlotte, Charlie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you over here. Fun fact, uh, she wants to be a boxer when she grows up. She likes boxing and MMA and things like that. And my gym is gonna be hosting an LGBTQ boxing tournament in 2024. And the owner of my gym specifically reached out to me to be like, Savvy, you should bring your dolls to the boxing tournament. Uh, I'm gonna bring her. I'll even write in one of the books. She'll even go to the boxing tournament, one of the books. She'll come visit Chicago just for that. So we're gonna start writing Meet Charlotte, which is gonna be book number one. Now we have these six books here. What was special about these books is that each one would come with a writing guide. Now I had to buy these used on Etsy, and so this was the only ones that I could find available. Thank you to whoever resold these. And unfortunately, the writing guide is missing only for book one. 
but we will start with book two and take a look at that. So for example, here's a book two, which is for your character blank learns a lesson, which is a school story. And then it has this guide, how to write an American girl story. So we're going to fill this out. So as it goes through it, it talks about like one, think about your character's problem and what she will learn. And it gives you kind of the formula of how they write and structure each of their stories, which is cool. It's kind of like a look behind the scenes and in a, a very in-depth tactile educational resource that kids can learn to learn how to write like a writer that they admire. Like I can't get over the brilliance of this. So the first thing you've got is like the main problem your character has is blank. And it even gives an example. For example, Molly's problem is that she doesn't like the lend a hand project her schoolmates have picked. So she starts her own secret project. In the end, she learns that cooperating with her schoolmates brings more success than working alone. Through this lesson, she learns why it's so important for the allies to cooperate to end World War II. Molly's learning some big lessons over here. I'm gonna have to make sure Charlotte learns big lessons too. But that is for the Learns a Lesson book. It, it breaks down like a little chapter outline. For each chapter, it's got who is in this chapter? Where does it take place? And what happens in this chapter? Look at this teaching kids good outlining skills and making writing outlines fun. I see why I grew up to become a writer. I love this shit. All right, so we're gonna start with Meet Charlotte. Now, it does come with these stencils, which are meant to kind of mimic the American Girls of Today font on here. So I could stencil it, but I think these are ugly and I'm gonna grab a calligraphy pen instead. All right, this pen uh, probably was a little thick for this cover, but this is how it turned out. Meet Charlotte. So it doesn't look the best, but I think it's fine. And then we're going to go with the year 2024 on here. We've got to wait for this to dry. I think the cover art should have some version of the picture that I took of her in the meat outfit that I created. I need to figure out how her boxing arc is going to happen over the course of this because I also have a workout outfit that I've set aside for her, all from clothes that I've bought on Etsy. Meet Charlotte 2024, written and illustrated by, I'll say the Savvy Rights Books YouTube community. Does this pen have ink? I'm all out of ink in my pens. All right, this is written and illustrated by Savvy Writes Books and the YouTube community. All right, so the table of contents has space for four chapters. So we're going to come up with four chapters right now, and we're going to come up with an arc for this book. This book is dedicated to Matt Walsh's wife. Matt Walsh's wife's kids. <laughs> I'm going to imply they're not Matt's kids. This book is dedicated to Matt Walsh's wife's kids. May they one day get the woke dolls their mom denied them <laughs> okay there we go this book is dedicated to matt walsh's wife's kids may they one day get the woke dolls their mom de denied them charlotte can have four family members and four friends all right so dude maybe i should live stream this process okay that's what we're doing see you in a bit So what I want to do right now is do the initial establishing things for the meat book. We can establish her as a character. We can figure out, you know, what she, what her goals are, all of that. So it has outline space to write four chapters. The book doesn't have that much space, so it's not going to be that long. I believe it has the pages numbered. The book is 20 pages total, and then it has a section called Looking at Today, which is kind of like the peek into the past section in the old American girl books. And in the peek into the past section, it just had like real historical facts about that time period. So this will be 2024, which we're not in yet, but I'll talk about the general early 2020s. So first, what we need to do is we need to figure out the main characters. If you guys remember the old American Girl books, they have a page for family and a page for friends where you can meet the characters. We got to give her, you know, any parents or siblings she might have. So I want to hear your guys' ideas. Should she have a mom and a dad? Should she have a single parent? Should she have... We only have space for four total family members. So we could do two parents and a sibling. We could do one parent and two siblings. We could do one parent, a sibling, and a dog. Like, what are you guys feeling for this? And then we can come up with her friends and their names on the next page. And this, I think, will help us establish the story as we go along. And while you guys are spewing ideas, I'm going to check the chat. We need an autistic American. I've been saying that. I posted on Instagram about that a little while ago. We need an autistic American girl doll. I totally agree. Uh, we have Kavi, who has ADHD, which I think is pretty cool. Kavi is 2023 Girl of the Year. Uh, I absolutely love her. She's probably my favorite Girl of the Year that they've ever had, because a lot of the Girl of the Years I don't like. Kavi has ADHD, and her story talks about it. And in the back, they show a board of advisors that they worked with uh, talking about, like... Uh, experts in childhood neurodivergence and things like that. So we do have an ADHD doll. 
I appreciate that as an ADHD adult. <laughs> Trans Autistic America. Yeah, why not, dude? Why not? Why not? I love the meat outfit that I created for her. She's got a little rainbow shirt. I got these items all on Etsy. She's got these cute camo boots, which are a motif along with she has like a camouflage workout top, uh, which I didn't even get from the same Etsy shop. This was just by chance that this worked out. Uh, but I, I got these from different Etsy shops and I love the, the rainbow uh, it's like a little pride shirt. Remember, we only have 20 pages to tell each story and there are 20 handwritten pages. <laughs> so the story, these stories are not gonna be long. We're gonna have to introduce the fact that she's trans probably in the first book. So maybe that'll be like the main plot of the first book. I've decided, I, I mentioned in the video that I made about her previously, canonically she is taking puberty blockers um, and she has socially transitioned at school and her name was also Charlie before she transitioned, but then she also has Charlotte as like her new full name that she uses. So maybe the first book is where she has to, was where she's coming out of the closet or something. What do we want for her family? Do we want her to have, what do you guys think about like her parents, siblings? Oh, you know what? She should have the American Girl dog, Coconut, right? Cause there's this whole, there's this whole American Girl conspiracy theory that Coconut the dog is trans. I think, and it's really because I think like they referred to Coconut as a boy when initially introduced and then referred to the dog as a girl later. Just, I think they just changed the dog, but there's like a whole conspiracy theory about it. So I think she can have, her dog can be named Coconut. That's just like a little reference. It's like a little Easter egg for the OG American Girl fans. <laughs> what should her mom's name be? trying to decide I her, her mom is is a lot I guess not every character has a mom like Marie Grace's mom dies of cholera before the book even starts uh but that's 1853 so that's a different era a lot of them have like it's about girls and their strong relationships with their moms and we can also explore a strong relationship with a trans girl with her mom it, as she's in the process of the mom coming to learn this this girl as her daughter so I think she should have a mom so we'll have Charlie's mom has got it going on. Maybe I'll, I'll name her mom Stacy as a reference to that. Oh, I like the name Lexi that Jazzy Wolf just came up with, but I just wrote Stacy in pen, so I think Lexi's gonna be her older sister because I wanna use the name Lexi now. Should she have an older sister, younger sister? Older sister, because then we could have a cute scene where like her older sister gives her some hand-me-down clothes to help her feel affirmed as a girl. Because I know a lot of the American Girl dolls in their books are like, nine to ten years old but some of the girls of the year and some of the like contemporary dolls they make like 12 to 13. so i think just because i want her to be in middle school because like in elementary school they don't usually gender segregate the sports that hard so it's not really like much of a story as much so i think we'll have her do middle school sports so she'll be like 12 to 14 over the course of these books. Oh yeah, her sister. Okay, as people are bringing up, older sister could teach her about makeup. I love that. I love that. So this this will be, well, it does say on the front that it should be a family story. It says, it says that right there, a family story. We have four slots to come up with friends for her. I'm excited to do like some uh, little art with markers and like, it's not even gonna look good. It's just gonna be creative and fun. Oh, Ripley's here. Ripley made fan art of Charlie way back in January, 2023, like 11 months ago. So it's good to see Ripley. And I featured Ripley's fan art in the video that I put up back in January. The art is great. I'll make sure to include it in this upcoming video too. She's got a single mom. So I guess one of the family friends could theoretically be like her mom's boyfriend or something that could come up. If her mom's gonna get remarried in one of the books, that could be a thing we have. We could also have some of her friends from school. We could have some of her, we could have her coach like a sports team coach that she relies on. Could have a, she definitely needs a best friend. Maybe she should have a male and a female best friend because a lot of the American girls will have a female best friend, right? Because then they sold like the best friend dolls for a little while in the uh, 2000s. She needs a, a, a girl best friend and then maybe a boy best friend. And then maybe like a coach or something like that. Most middle schools aren't gonna have like boxing teams. So she probably plays other sports in middle school. Maybe she plays, uh, let's see, we've already got Julie as the women's basketball girl, but we could have her play women's basketball also because the Daily Wire just put out that really awful, shitty comedy that's supposed to be about why trans women shouldn't play basketball or whatever. So she could play basketball. Um, 
So Jazzy says, what about Adam, who's been her friend since they were in kindergarten, and then Blaze, who joined the group? Okay, that's cute. Blaze. That reminds <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't see the name Blaze without thinking of Degrassi The Next Generation Season 8 when Emma smokes weed for the first time and has everyone call her Blaze. Uh, oh, Heckleg also likes Blaze. You know what? We'll name her Blaze. Why not? Blaze it. And then there's Brody. Brody's a good name, too. Let's see. We can add, Yeah, Adam will be her her best friend since childhood. And I guess Adam thought they were going to, you know, be boy best friends together but then charlie can't, comes out as trans when she's like 12 so then uh but and adam is you know navigating the new dynamic of now having a girl best friend that can be a whole thing so we'll have adam this is fun i love writing with other people especially like since i'm not writing these to sell i'm writing these just to have fun putting in a video and i also have the idea that like Maybe in the future, if if I get all of this done and it's like a bundle, I could auction it off for uh, an LGBT charity or something. Blaze, the new girl in school. I think we should do basketball. I think because we Julie plays basketball, so I don't want to like repeat shit they've already done. But also, you know, middle schools don't really have boxing teams, so she's not going to do like boxing's her ultimate goal. Uh, someone on Instagram came up with the idea that she should have a scene where she runs up the Philadelphia Art Museum steps like in Rocky. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So she definitely goes to a boxing gym because she likes watching boxing. She'll be on the school basketball team. Okay. You know what? Char her mom will be a, a female boxer. A female boxer who owns a gym. So her mom is a gym owner, and that's why Charlie's always grown up around the gym. That's a good idea. I like that idea, Lindsay. So her mom owns a gym. Her older sister isn't that into going to the gym, but she does teach her about uh, how to do makeup, which will be really a really sweet scene. Um, okay, so we've got Adam, we've got Blaze, who is her new friend on the basketball team. That Brody's a good name. I like that. Brody should be somebody. Let's see. What should we name her basketball coach? Let me name her Coach Brody. Let's name her that. Let's have Coach Brody. Oh, her sister takes her dress shopping for a school dance. That's such a good idea. Maybe that'll happen in the first book. We have a space for a fourth friend, but you know what? I, I think we've got enough to start outlining the story now. So I, I don't, I think we can figure out the fourth friend later. All right, so we've got space for four chapters and we've got 20 pages. So this story can't be very long. Thinking of the plot of the first book, I don't think the book should necessarily be, I mean, it can't, if you guys think it would be cool to have it be about coming out of the closet, it can be. Maybe it should, because they don't have an American Girl book about that yet. Okay, so maybe it's the start of the school year. Okay, it's the start of the school year, right? And she's about to come out. And, or she comes out at the start of the school year because she just started taking puberty blockers the summer before. And she comes out of the closet and is transitioning at school and is now joining the girls basketball team. And this it establishes that. So the book will be about coming out. Yeah, coming out story. Because we don't have one of those as an American Girl book yet. She has her friend from childhood, Adam, that she has to come out to. And she'll meet a new girl on the girls basketball team, Blaze, that she will... Um, It'll be nice. It'll be nice for her because she'll have a new friendship with someone who's never known her before transition, and then sh Coach Brody will be like a mentor figure to her. Book two will be when the school starts to challenge whether she should be allowed on the women's team, and that's when uh, she'll have to learn to speak up for the school board. So we got the plot to book two pretty well outlined. I think in chapter four. Maybe there should be like middle school doesn't really have homecoming dances, so maybe there won't be a homecoming dance. But the end of the book, let's see, how do we want it to, we know that the start of the book is that she's going to come out. The end of the book can involve her sister, her sister maybe should teach her makeup in like the third chapter. So this is going to be short. There's only four chapters. Oh, she could, yeah, because she colors, she does have this pink hair. I found this pink wig on Etsy. So she, I guess, has naturally like dark brown hair and has started dyeing it pink just to have a, a fun new color. So maybe in chapter three, she and her sister will do like a beauty routine. They'll like dye their hair together and uh, do makeup and things like that. Yeah, we did have school dances in a middle school too. Yeah, that's true. I just don't want too much to happen in this book because there's only four chapters and it's only allowed to be 20 pages. So it's a, this is a fun writing challenge. This is just like a creative challenge for fun. I love that. Chapter one, I think will be the first day of school. So chapter one is the first day of school. 
basketball season, first day of school is going to be football season. But that's okay. Like, maybe the coach is also the gym teacher, so she can still meet the coach. And she can meet her friend Blaze and learn that they're both going to try out for the basketball team. Which they'll, they'll do in book two. Book two will be about the basketball team. And the first person she tells will be Adam. Yeah, I think that makes sense. But yeah, I guess since her name is roughly the same, like, she won't have to come out to everyone at once. She can come out to Adam first and he can help her gain the courage to start coming out to other people and uh, joining the girls basketball team. And she'll have to use the girls locker room for the first time and things like that. If she's not out to everyone at school yet, she might not be comfortable using the girls locker room yet. So she might have to, maybe in chapter two, she'll have to come out to her gym teacher. So coming out to Adam, okay. And then she'll like use the boys locker room for the last time and realize that she needs to come out to her gym teacher so that she can stop having to do that. Chapter two will be, I'm gonna call it gym girls, because you'll, we can see her working out with her mom at the gym that her mom owns, and we can get introduced to her mom. And then we can also have her come out to her gym teacher. All right, so in gym girls, she'll work out at mom's gym, and then maybe Coach Brody, the gym teacher, will say, hey, you should try out for the girls' basketball team. We got a spot. <laughs> and that'll encourage her to do that for book two. I'm still the same Charlie, just, yeah. Maybe, I don't think she'll say her own dead name out loud in the book. I mean, maybe she will. I don't know. I'm not trans, so I, I, but I feel like most trans people I know would feel uncomfortable saying that. I don't know. It depends on the person, I guess. But maybe she would say like, I'm still the same Charlie. I'm just also Charlotte now or something like that. Yeah, I, she could have a line like that. I think that's a great idea. Isaac says, this could be a story of her finding her confidence and learning to accept and love herself for who she is. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what, I mean, that's a common American girls theme, right? So, first day of school is chapter one, gym girls is chapter two, chapter three is her sister, did you do a si sister makeover, her sister gives her a makeover, <laughs> that'll be fun. Chapter three is called sister makeover, and her older sister will help her learn how to do hair and makeup, and that'll help her when she returns to school on Monday to finally feel ready to present herself to everyone. So maybe chapter four, like someone said, I'm still Charlie, so chapter four will be called still the same Charlie. Okay, so we've got four chapters. We've got the four chapters lined up now. Um, I'm still me. I love that. Okay, guys, I think we have the first book figured out. So I'll write a synopsis of this, and then I'm going to film myself just writing the text of the book. Charlie has always loved sports and training at her mom's gym. That's the summary. It doesn't give me much space to write one on the back. So the summary is... Charlie has always loved sports and training at her mom's gym, but the start of seventh grade brings the first year of Charlotte, Charlie's new full name now that she's transitioning to life as a girl. Can Charlie find the courage to come out to her friends and teachers? That's that's just the, that's the synopsis of book one. So that's Meet Charlotte. Book two will be Charlotte Learns a Lesson, and it will be about her having to gain the courage to speak for the school board. So each book is going to have one main event because they're all pretty short. No, see, this is what's fun. I did not make these book templates myself. Okay, this was a big thing in the mid-90s. When you bought an American Girl doll, because in 1995, American Girl started releasing non-historical dolls for the first time. They started releasing the line that was then called American Girl of Today, then became Just Like You, and is now the Truly Me line. Uh, which is the dolls that are blank slates. They don't have their own characterizations. But the idea behind it was, what if you got this doll, and you can get clothes for her that are, you know, of now, of this era, and you made a doll of today. This was before they started releasing their Girl of the Year line and stuff like that. So they're like, make your own doll that's set in today's history. What do you think is going to be historical about today's moments? And it would come with the this book, the blank book that has meet blank so that you name your own doll. And then it comes with a writing guide. I bought these used on Etsy and the uh, writing guide for book one is missing. I have the writing guide for book two. So this one, book two might be a little easier because it comes with a little outline for us to do. It's a great way to teach kids about writing, to get kids interested in storytelling and things like that. I'm really sad that they stopped making these, but I bought them on Etsy to use for this video. The base doll for this was sent to me by Janelle, who's sometimes in the chat. She didn't have anything to do with the doll anymore, so she mailed her to me, and then I bought this wig for her on Etsy, and I remodeled her and refurbished her and got her new outfit, and now she's Charlotte. Thank you for being here today to work on this with me. 
Hello everybody, I would like to confirm that yesterday I finished the first book in the series, Meet Charlotte. This is the cover I drew. Ignore the quality of my drawing. I think the, the drawing that I put on the cover page looks a lot cuter. But regardless, this is Meet Charlotte and I'm gonna read you guys the first story in the series. And then we'll talk about book two, which I am now in the process of creating. So here is book one, here is Meet Charlotte. Chapter one is called First Day of School. Hey, Charlie, Charlotte's best friend, Adam, called to her, rushing down the school hallway. Ready for gym class? It was only 9 a.m. on Charlotte's first day of seventh grade, but Adam was already a ball of excitement. I guess so, said Charlotte, nervously gripping the straps of her backpack. Your hair has gotten so long over the summer, Adam said with a laugh. I'll bet Miss Brody will make you tie it up in a ponytail for gym class, just like the girls. Charlotte laughed along quietly, but inside her stomach was turning. She was one of the girls, only no one knew that yet. No one except her mom, her older sister Lexi, and Dr. Roland down at the Philadelphia Children's Hospital. Charlotte realized almost two years ago that she was transgender, meaning when she was born, the doctor said, it's a boy, but ever since Charlotte was old enough to talk, she always knew she was supposed to be a girl. When she imagined herself growing up, she always pictured herself becoming a mom, not a dad. She always imagined herself growing up to be a woman, not a man. Charlotte first expressed these feelings to her mom back in fifth grade, and after nearly two years of counseling sessions with a therapist, Charlotte's doctor realized she was probably right. She was supposed to be a girl. So Dr. Roland prescribed something called puberty blockers, a temporary medication that would prevent Charlotte from entering male puberty while trying out life as a girl. Dr. Roland told Charlotte that often transgender people might start going by a new name, one that fits with traditional naming conventions. Well, Charlotte's name had always been Charlie and she liked being a Charlie, but now she could be a girl Charlie. Thus, Charlotte was born. But Charlotte still hadn't told her teachers or principal that she was Charlotte now. That's why on the first day of seventh grade, Charlotte followed Adam to the boys locker room for what she hoped would be the last time. Hey, Adam, she said as the two of them walked through the locker room door. Yeah, he asked with a smile. You can still call me Charlie, but this past summer, my family also started calling me Charlotte. So you are one of the girls, Adam replied with a smile. Then he giggled. I never knew I'd have a girl as my best friend. So that's chapter one. Chapter two is called Gym Girls. Here we go. Gym class was okay, but Charlotte's favorite place to exercise was Funtime Fitness, the small gym her mom owned. Charlotte got off the school bus in front of her house, then walked three blocks in the crisp autumn air to her mom's gym. The gym had all kinds of weightlifting machines, plus a giant boxing ring in the middle of the main room. Sometimes, Charlie's mom, Stacy, would give her one-on-one -on -one boxing lessons in the gym. Charlie loved boxing even more than she loved her other favorite sport, basketball. She loved watching boxing matches and MMA fights on TV, and she'd grown to idolize women like Fallon Fox and Alana McLaughlin, who were making huge strides for the visibility of transgender athletes. How was school, Mom asked as soon as Charlie walked through the door. It was pretty good, said Charlie. I told Adam that I'm Charlotte now, I mean. How did that go, Mom asked. Charlie laughed. He's surprised to have a girl best friend. Charlie's mom laughed, too. That sounds like typical Adam. She grabbed a spray bottle and some old rags from on top of the gym's check-in counter and started walking around the gym, wiping down the machines. Charlie grabbed another rag and followed behind her mom, hoping to help out. Hey, Mom, she asked. Yes, Mom answered as she swiped the rag across the handle of a treadmill. I think I should tell Miss Brody, too. Charlie started wiping the treadmill's other handle, nervously avoiding eye contact. I don't want to use the boys' locker room anymore. Do you feel ready, Mom asked, to officially come out? The thought of coming out, a term used by LGBTQ people to address the first time they tell people of their LGBTQ status, made Charlie's heart feel fluttery. She wasn't sure if the fluttering was a sign of anxiety or excitement. Still, she nodded. Charlie didn't want to use the boys' bathroom or have teachers refer to her as he anymore. I'm ready, Charlie said with a smile, but I think first I should change my look. I want people to know I'm a new Charlie. Mom smiled. You know who can help you with that, right? Charlie and her mom laughed together. Lexi, they said in unison. And then we're into chapter three, which is called Sister Makeover. Lexi, Charlie's older sister, was 16 years old, and she was always on top of the latest fashion trends. When Charlie was younger, she used to get annoyed at Lexi for spending so much time doing her makeup every morning. She was always hogging the bathroom. But as Charlie entered her middle school years, she grew to appreciate Lexi's incredible makeup artistry skills. 
When Charlie and her mom got home from the gym, Lexi was already lying on her bed with her nose buried deep in her phone, probably watching more makeup tutorials on YouTube. Lexi's hair was bright pink. She'd just dyed it last week. Before that, it had been blue. Lexi loved experimenting with new hair colors. Hey, Lex, said Charlie, knocking on Lexi's doorframe. I was wondering if you could do me a favor. Lexi rolled her eyes. No, I'm not doing the dishes tonight. It's your week for dishes. Charlie laughed. No, not what I meant, she said. I was actually going to ask if you'd dye my hair pink for me and help teach me how to do makeup. Lexi shot up into a sitting position, almost throwing her phone in excitement. Oh my god, yes! Lexi brought a kitchen chair into the bathroom, and Charlie sat down. Then Lexi got her bottle of pink hair dye out of the cabinet. She covered her hands in rubber gloves, but set her phone in front of Charlie, propped up against the bathroom mirror. This is one of my favorite makeup channels, she said. While I dye your hair, you should watch this video. It'll teach you the basics. Charlie glanced at the phone screen, where a girl slightly older than Lexi was washing her face in preparation. Are you going to do my makeup too? Charlie asked. Lexi shook her head. Nope, she said. She grabbed a, a strand of Charlie's hair and carefully applied the pink hair dye. It's not safe to share makeup with someone else, especially eye products, she explained. But maybe this weekend we could go shopping together for some new makeup of your own. A huge smile broke out on Charlie's face. That would be amazing, she said. Thank you. No problem, sis, said Lexi, now painting another strand of Charlie's hair. Charlie's chest grew warm. She loved it when Lexi called her sis. All right, so now we're on to chapter four, the last chapter called Still the Same Charlie. Pink hair, cool, Adam shouted, running up to Charlie in the hallway. You look just like Lexi now. Charlie smiled. Yeah, I guess I do. Well, it makes sense. After all, we are sisters. That's true, said Adam, nodding. I never thought of it that way before, but I guess I have a girl best friend, and now Lexi has a little sister, too. The two walked down the hall together until they reached the locker rooms. Well, I'll see you in class, Charlie said, heading into the girls' locker room. Oh, yeah, Adam called. I guess you'll be in there now. Charlie laughed. Then she walked into the locker room, ready to change for gym class. Going into the girls' locker room for the first time wasn't as scary as Charlie expected. There were girls just minding their own business, putting on their gym shorts, many sneaking into a bathroom or shower stall if they desired extra privacy. Charlie definitely wanted extra privacy for herself, too. When she came out of the bathroom stall in her t-shirt and athletic shorts, Charlie saw a new face over by the sinks. A thin blonde girl with a high ponytail. Charlie walked up to the sink next to her and turned on the water to wash her hands. Hi, said the new girl. I'm Blaze. I'm new here this year. Nice to meet you, said Charlie. My name is Charlotte. You can call me Charlie, though. Blaze dried her hands with a paper towel. Good to meet you, Charlie, she said. In gym class, Miss Brody told everyone to play dodgeball, which was always fun. Then, at the end of class, she gathered all the students for an announcement. As you may have heard, I'm going to coach girls basketball this year, she said. Tryouts will be in a few weeks, so ladies, get ready. A few girls cheered. Blaze turned to face Charlie. I love basketball, she said. I think I want to try out. Charlie thought about it for a moment. I think I will too, she said. After gym class, once everyone had changed back into their regular school clothes, Charlie introduced Adam to Blaze in the hallway. Two girls as my friends, he gasped. I guess this is seventh grade. They all laughed. You know, said Adam as the three walked down the hallway to their next class, I thought things might be different now that you're Charlotte. But I like Charlotte, he smiled. You're still the same, Charlie. Okay, so that's the end of book one. And then, as you know, the American Girl historical books always have the peak at the past section in the back. So for the first one, I decided to just write about, like, what LGBTQ terms mean as an introduction for whoever's reading it. And then in book two, we're going to talk about the more of the conflicts that LGBTQ people face. But first, this is just an introductory section. So in the back where it's like the real fact section, I start with what is LGBTQ? LGBTQ stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. It is a name for a demographic of people who exist outside of traditional gender norms, whether that is in their romantic relationships or in their gender presentation. For example, a woman who marries another woman instead of marrying a man might refer to herself as a lesbian. What is transgender? Transgender people, like Charlotte, live as a different gender than what they're assumed to be at birth. For example, when Charlotte was born, her doctor examined her body and said it's a boy. But Charlotte never felt like being a boy fit her. She could never imagine herself growing up to be a man. When someone suspects that they're transgender, they will often meet with a doctor and a therapist to understand their next steps. After Charlotte met with a therapist who agreed that Charlotte was experiencing gender dysphoria, Charlie's doctor prescribed her puberty blockers, and then the next... Thing is what is dysphoria dysphoria refers to the experience of feeling distressed with an element of your physical body that doesn't match your internal mental understanding of yourself imagine if you woke up tomorrow in someone else's body you would probably feel very strange and you'd likely try to figure out how to get your own body back charlotte struggles with the feeling that her physical body which has the parts that boys usually have does not match her mental perception of herself as a girl this is gender dysphoria and then we've got what are puberty blockers 
Going through puberty can be tough on everyone. It also introduces another set of challenges to trans people, many of whom would feel worse dysphoria by going through puberty of the wrong sex. To help, doctors may sometimes prescribe a medication to put a temporary pause on puberty. This allows a person to prevent their body from going through permanent changes until they are old enough for them and a doctor to determine whether they may need other treatments like hormone replacement or surgery. And then the last page is, what is Charlotte's path? Charlotte is 12 years old at the start of this book, and she'll turn 13 soon. Right now, she takes puberty blockers. In a few years, likely when she's 16 or older, she may work with a doctor to start hormone therapy. For now, Charlie's biggest challenge is letting everyone know she's a girl and finding her place as a daughter, sister, and friend. So that's the end of the book, and then it has a little about the author section, so I drew, like, my face hiding behind the YouTube play button. And it says, Savvy Raids Books is a book and writing YouTuber with a big doll obsession. She wrote these books with the help of her audience who gave her plot and character suggestions while Savvy wrote these books on in live streams and videos. So that is book one. That is Meet Charlotte. I am now in the process of planning book two, Charlotte Learns a Lesson. Haven't uh, colored the cover in yet. I have the writing guide for this one. So I've been using the writing guide to map out the book. And I think it's so cool how it, it has you like figure out, okay, here's how the American Girl stories are written. The character both has to learn a lesson at school, and then that is a lesson that will teach them something about the broader context of the era they're living in in the world around them. It gave me space to fill in what's the problem that my character has. And I said that Charlie wants to try out for girls basketball, but this, there's a district-wide uh, legislation, like a district-wide rule that's being proposed to ban transgender athletes in, in the school dish. The school lesson she's going to learn is about public speaking and the democratic process and the importance of free speech and having her voice heard. And then the lesson she's going to learn about herself and the world is how much her voice matters in making a change. It gave me space to plot out new characters, so I added some teachers and school board members. And then I mapped out the four chapters of the book right here. So it has chapter one, uh, and then you have to fill out who is in the chapter and where it takes place and then what happens in the chapter. I think this is a fantastic way to teach kids about how to structure a story, how to break a story down into chapters. And while these are only, they only give you 20 pages in space for four chapters, it does start get you thinking about longer forms of writing. Because in school you might be writing like an essay here or there, but very rarely are teachers going to get you invested in like the structure of how to write a novel. And these are not novels by any means. I just read that to you super quickly. But I just think it's a really good breakdown to help kids understand the organization of writing a story and make it not feel so daunting and see how to break it up into smaller pieces. These writing guides are honestly brilliant. I absolutely love these. I wish they still had them. They're so great. And then for like the real, the looking at today, the real facts about the era section in the back, I'm going to write about like the anti-LGBTQ legislation that's being proposed in multiple states and how that compares to this. So that's going to be Charlotte Learns a Lesson, book two. Hello, everybody. I'm here with my Mary Pittmas mug and I have just finished writing writing book two in the Charlotte series. I think this is going to be the last book that I will complete for this video because now I have a lot of editing to do on this video, so I won't have time to write the others, but I do want this to be a thing that I continue into 2024 and something that we can continue working on as a community. So if you have other ideas for the upcoming books, please let me know in the comments below. Maybe we could do a little live stream type of thing. I've got the writing guides for the other four books and I will color in this cover soon. But now we are going to read together Charlotte Charlotte Learns a Lesson, Book Two, A School Story. Here we go. This book is dedicated to all the children of homophobic politicians. You deserve better. <laughs> okay, here we go. Chapter one is called Girls Basketball. When Coach Brody blew the whistle, Charlie knew it was time to dribble the ball to center court. She and her new friend Blaze were at girls' basketball tryouts for their 7th grade team, and it was time for everyone to huddle around Coach Brody. Charlie and Blaze sprinted down the court, each dribbling a basketball as they joined the growing huddle. Thank you all for coming to tryouts today, Coach Brody announced. Tomorrow, I'll email everyone's parents a list of who made the team. It's going to be a tough choice with so many wonderful girls trying out. As the huddle broke apart, Charlie felt a tap on her shoulder. It was Coach Brody. Charlotte, can I see you in my office before you head home? Coach Brody asked. Charlie felt nervous. She'd never had a teacher ask to meet with her before. Was she in trouble? Charlie followed Coach Brody into her office, a small alcove attached to the girls' locker room. Did I do something wrong? Charlie asked. Not at all, said Coach Brody. You did an excellent job at tryouts today. I really want to put you on the team. But, but, that didn't sound good. But what, Charlie asked. Coach Brody took a deep breath. Our school district is considering passing a new rule, a rule saying that you'd have to play on the boys' team instead. 
Charlie's stomach felt sick. This year, seventh grade was Charlie's first year out of the closet as Charlotte, a transgender girl. When she was born, the doctor said, it's a boy, and Charlie tried to live as a boy throughout her childhood. But now, as she was about to enter her teen years, Charlie was starting her gender transition. Her first step was working with a doctor at the Philadelphia Children's Hospital to take puberty blockers, a medication that put a pause on male puberty. In a few years, Charlotte planned to start hormone therapy and go through, pe and go through female puberty instead. Charlie didn't have anything against the boys' basketball team. It just wasn't where she felt she belonged as a girl. But I'm not a boy, said Charlie. I know, said Coach Brody, nodding. That's what I told the district officials. They said they're worried your body will give you an unfair advantage against other girls. My body, Charlie asked, confused. Charlie's puberty blockers made it so she didn't have the body of a pubescent boy. If anything, the boys on the team who'd had growth spurts would have an advantage over her. Plus, Charlie wasn't better at basketball than any other girl who practiced. Blaze had destroyed her at tryouts, constantly catching Charlie's rebounds and running them up the court to score a basket of her own. Is there anything we can do about it, Charlie asked. The school board is meeting next Monday to vote on it, said Coach Brody. Let's see if we can brainstorm some ideas before then. Chapter two is called American Values. The next day at school, Charlie struggled to focus. All she could think about was the stupid new rule that she'd have to play on the boys' team. Boys' tryouts had happened a week ago. In reality, if this rule passed, Charlie wouldn't be able to play basketball at all. She sat at her desk in social studies class next to her lifelong best friend, Adam, trying to listen to Mrs. Mack's boring lecture about the branches of U.S. government. And who remembers which branch of government gets to vote on new laws, Mrs. Mack asked the class. Adam raised his hand. The legislative branch? That's right, said Mrs. Mack. Charlie sighed and looked down at her textbook. The only rule being voted on that she cared about was the school board's vote on Monday, which would seal her middle school athletic fate. Now, to review for next week's test, said Mrs. Mack, who remembers how many amendments are in the Bill of Rights? Ten, said Blaze from the back of the classroom. Very good, said Mrs. Mack, but please raise your hand next time. Now, what's the First Amendment? Freedom of speech, Blaze shouted. Remember to raise your hand. Adam leaned over in his seat and whispered to Charlotte. Isn't that funny how Blaze got criticized for shouting the answer when her answer was freedom of speech? Charlie laughed quietly. It was kind of funny. Freedom of speech is an important American value, said Mrs. Mack. It's what allows us all the right to say when we disagree with a law that our government makes. Like Blaze having the freedom to disagree with the raise your hand rule, Adam whispered with a laugh. Wait, that was it. Charlotte could almost feel the little light bulb flickering on inside her brain. If she disagreed with the rule, she could use her right as an American to speak up about it, her freedom of speech. That was a true American value. Chapter three is called Finding a Voice. Charlie's newfound excitement didn't last long. In gym class on Friday, she brought up her idea to Coach Brody. You should absolutely speak up, Coach Brody agreed. In fact, I think you should make a speech in front of the school board on Monday before they vote. Charlie felt nauseous all over again. Speak in front of the school board? Charlie could barely summon the courage to do regular presentations in front of her class. After school on Friday, Charlie went to Funtime Fitness, the gym her mom owned. While her mom checked in guests at the front desk, Charlie put on her boxing gloves, a pair her mom passed down to her that she used to wear when she took boxing lessons as a kid, and headed for the punching bags. Practicing her boxing technique was always a way to get out some nervous energy. Charlotte, honey, are you okay? Came her mom's voice from behind her. You've been hitting that bag with the same right hook for the past 20 minutes. Charlie stopped, then turned around to look at her mom. I guess I zoned out, she said. What's wrong, hun? Charlie sighed and dropped her gloved hands to her sides. Coach Brody said I should speak to the school board on Monday before they vote on the sports rule. I think that's a great idea, her mom said, nodding. Your voice should be heard. The board members need to hear from someone that their rule will affect. I know, said Charlie with a sigh, but I don't even know what to say. And what if I get too nervous and mess the whole thing up? Well, said mom, why do you practice basketball before a team tryout? Why do you work on your boxing technique with me in the gym? to get better at those skills, said Charlie, because practicing helps you get better. Exactly, said Mom. If you want your speech to be great, the best way to do that is to practice. I know how to practice sports already, said Charlie, but I don't know how to practice a speech. I don't have a coach for that. I'll be your coach, Mom said, smiling. Did you know that back when I first opened this gym 10 years ago, I had to make a speech of my own? Charlie's eyes grew wide. You did, she asked. Yep, Mom said, nodding. I had to convince a room full of rich business people to give me a loan so that I could afford the equipment and the rent for this place. I had to gather all kinds of data about my business plan and how the gym would make money. It took a lot of research and practice, but look at this place now. Charlie looked around the gym with all of its machines, racks of weights, punching bags, and most of all, happy customers exercising. Can you help me with my speech? Charlie asked. Be my coach? Mom smiled. Of course, she said. Just call me Coach Mom. 
And then chapter four is called Charlie the Champion. Charlie's hands were shaking as she stepped up to the podium at Monday's school board meeting. She held a stack of papers in her hands, the research and the talking points she'd put together with Coach Mom. As she approached the microphone, she looked out at the school board members, plus the other parents and teachers who sat behind them in the school's auditorium seats. Coach Brody flashed her a big smile. Mom gave Charlie a thumbs up. Charlie took a deep breath and began her speech. My name is Charlotte, she said. I'm in seventh grade, and there's nothing I love more than playing sports. Sports teach you teamwork, patience, and the importance of practicing a skill if you want to be good at it. Those skills helped me write this speech. I used teamwork when asking my mom and Coach Brody for encouragement, and I practiced this speech a lot in front of the mirror at home. A few teachers in the audience smiled, giving quiet laughs. I should be allowed to play girls basketball just like any other girl, Charlie continued. A lot of people keep saying that a trans girl like me might have an advantage over other girls, and that's why I brought the facts with me today. Charlotte then explained what puberty blockers are. She told the board that her medication has temporarily stopped puberty. She showed the board statistics about transgender athletes, including facts about how even in adult athletes, trans women have the same athletic capabilities as all other women, especially after taking hormone therapy. When Charlie finished her speech, she stared out at the nine board members. I'm glad you brought up the science, said Miss Locke, a board member in a blazer. I played women's basketball back in college, and I never learned any of that. I didn't really understand how puberty blockers worked, said Mr. Elmer, the board president. I think your speech has changed my vote. Charlie's chest swelled. Thank you, she said. And when the board voted five to four against the new rule, Charlie's heart leapt. She'd been responsible for changing two of those votes. Her voice did matter. And that's the end of the book. And then in the looking at today section, I have LGBTQ laws of the 2020s. I don't have this part completed yet, but that's what I've got so far for book two. Book three is supposed to be about a holiday story. So I'm going to start coming up with ideas for that. But I'm excited to continue this project into the new year. I kind of want to do this again and just make like lots of American Girl characters and write a bunch of books for all these characters that uh, let me know. But I'm, I'm happy having a really good time with this and I hope you guys have been enjoying this but now uh, we're gonna get back into the main body of our video everything about those blank books got me so excited those books and their accompanying writing guides said to child savvy hey these dolls might not be historical but they're still alive in the same way you're still immersed in their world this form of play is about literacy about reading comprehension about imagination that's what American Girl was when it was great, but everything changed when the Mattel nation attacked. I think Babbity Kate actually made a similar joke to that in her American Girl Zombie Apocalypse video. Watch that if you haven't already, it's great. Anyway, let's move together into a new millennium, which is filled with an entirely new direction for our favorite brand. The Mattel buyout. The 2000s rang in a new millennium and a new ownership of the American Girl brand. After signing a deal with Mattel in 1998, Pleasant Roland officially sold Pleasant Company to Mattel, which they then rebranded as just American Girl, though they kept the Pleasant Company branding on the dolls for a few years, likely to ease the transition. Technically, Kit was the first doll released after Pleasant Company signed its rights over to Mattel. However, we covered Kit in the previous section because Kit was in development right during that transitional phase, and as a result, she's very much in line with the dolls released under Pleasant Company and her books are in the same format. She has a Pleasant Company neck tattoo rather than an American Girl one, all of that. Kaya, the first ever indigenous American Girl doll, was released in 2002. I haven't read her book yet because, as I mentioned, my dogs Chewie and Harlow bought me her collection as a Christmas gift so I can't open it yet, but Kaya is a really cool doll and a longtime fan favorite. Much like with Addie's books, American Girl put together an advisory board to make sure that Kaya's books were as accurate of a portrayal of the Nez Perce culture as possible. An article posted to the American Girl website back in 2018 read, Representation, nothing about us without us. In creating our Native American character, Kaya, we sought permission from the Nez Perce tribe to tell Kaya's story. With their approval and suggestions, we established an eight-member advisory board that included Nez Perce tribal elders to help ensure the historical accuracy and cultural authenticity of Kaya's story and products. As the advisory board said, it has been a wonderful experience working with the gentle, knowledgeable, and culturally sensitive people on the staff at American Girl. We were asked to be on the advisory board to retain a true sense of the unique Nez Perce history and culture in Kaya products, and we are grateful to American Girl for their willingness to listen and to respect the 
the wishes of the board. We commend them because in our opinion, they've gotten it right. One detail that I always found really interesting about Kaya is that she's the first doll to have her mouth fully closed. For Kaya, American Girl created a new face mold known as the Kaya mold, which features a closed mouth, whereas the other dolls show their two teeth in a smile. As is explained on the American Girl wiki page for the Kaya face mold, the most prominent difference is that unlike all the other face molds, the mouth is closed and shows no teeth. This is due to a cultural taboo in the Nimipu Nez Perce culture of bearing teeth as it shows aggression. The early 2000s also saw an introduction of a new line of dolls to American Girl, the Girl of the Year line. Girl of the Year was one of the first big changes made under Mattel, and that is the change of creating products with limited edition as part of it, creating products that were made with scarcity in mind. The first Girl of the Year released in 2001 was named Lindsay, and I remember seeing the catalog that year, and when it said Lindsay was only available for one year, I was like, what? Even my mom looked at it and was like, okay, that's bullshit. But Girl of the Year eventually ended up becoming a staple of the American Girl brand, featuring beloved characters like 2018's Luciana, who has controversies of her own, we'll get into those later, and 2023's Kavi, a theater kid with ADHD. Luciana, Kavi, those are the nerdy ones, not Molly, them, they are. In the 2000s, we also got a few other historical dolls, including one of my favorites, Rebecca Rubin, a Jewish girl living in 1914 who loves early cinema and silent movies, and Julie Albright, a 1970s Brady Bunch looking girl who loves basketball and joins the fight for girls sports in schools. Overall, the addition of the girl of the year was probably the biggest change thus far, but the 2000s were overall, at least from what I remember, a pretty unproblematic decade for the American girl brand. Business was booming and the dolls were selling better than ever, now under the ownership of a huge company with the resources to produce anything possible. The sky was the limit. That was until the 2010s began, which was the decade of controversies. The 2010s controversies. In the 2010s, we saw the release of the historical dolls Melody, a black girl who dreams of being a singer during the 1960s civil rights movement, and Mary Ellen, a girl living with polio in the 1950s. I don't have either of these dolls, maybe in the future I'll get them, I don't know, we'll see. All I know is that Melody had an Amazon Prime TV special that I watched while recovering from getting a new tattoo, and I was very disappointed in how unfaithful it was to the books, though it was a pretty heartwarming movie on its own. There was also the release of Nenea, another World War II doll, but this time she showing the story from a different perspective. Nenea lives in Hawaii and her mother is indigenous Hawaiian and Nenea's story takes place right as Japan bombs Pearl Harbor. Nenea is another doll that I don't yet have but will probably get at some point in the future. She has a new face mold known as the Nenea mold. The 2010s were overall a decade of controversy for the American Girl brand. We'll start with the one that I think we can all agree on hating together, Be Forever Rebranding. This is a Be Forever book about Kit and this book looks like shit, look at this. There are no color illustrations. This book is absolute cheap trash. Be Forever was American Girl's attempt to rebrand the historical dolls, which they did in 2014. This involved condensing all six of each doll's books into two books, which caused a lot of the content to be cut out, one of those major pieces being the absolutely gorgeous art inside, and then re-releasing all the dolls with outfits that were much less accurate to their time periods, but were made with brighter colors, I guess, to be marketable. Shiny. The 2010s also saw the rapid creation and archiving of three wonderful historical characters who were here for much too short of a time. First, Caroline Abbott, a girl with gorgeous teal eyes who's from the War of 1812. And it's a shame they got rid of her too, considering we have no other doll from that time period. As far as the 1800s goes, we have Josefina from 1824 and Addie from 1864 and nobody else because guess what? They archived Kirsten too. Caroline was released in 2012, but shortly after, archived in 2015. We briefly did have two other 19th century dolls during this period, two of my favorites of all time, and those are Cecile and Marie Grace. Cecile and Marie Grace are a pair of dolls from 1850s New Orleans. At the start of the first book, Marie Grace and her father moved to New Orleans, which is originally where she was from, but they move back there after Marie Grace's mother dies of cholera. Marie Grace is still mourning her mother, but she's excited to return to New Orleans and learn all about the city and what it has to offer. She also learns that in New Orleans, there's this concept of free people of color, which in the book is referred to with a French name that I'm not even gonna try to pronounce because I don't speak French. 
But basically it means that while slavery is still legal in much of the American South, New Orleans is different. And while Marie Grace is shy and reserved, she meets a girl whose confidence she envies, Cecile, who is one of the free people of color who comes from a wealthy high status family. Cecile and Marie Grace quickly become friends. They have a lovely time attending Mardi Gras together, taking singing lessons from Madame Ocean. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, and then they volunteer at an orphanage during a drastic yellow fever outbreak. Marie Grace also introduced a new face mold, which is called the Marie Grace mold, and is one of my absolute favorite face molds of all time. When Marie Grace and Cecile were archived in 2014, no other dolls had this face mold until they released Kavi, the girl of the year of 2023, one of my favorites who just looks absolutely fabulous with this mold. They also used the Marie Grace mold on the special edition Rapunzel Disney princess doll, which I'll talk about later because I have weirdly mixed feelings on her. So anyway, I'm bringing Marie Grace and her friend Cecile with me during my next trip to New Orleans because I just bring dolls on every trip I take there lately. It's gonna be great. Cecile, Marie, Grace, and Caroline were all gone after the Be Forever rebrand. I mean, I guess Caroline survived one year because she was archived in 2015 instead of 2014, but they got rid of all these fantastic historical dolls. Now, thankfully, the Be Forever branding was dropped in 2019 because nobody liked it. Unfortunately, dropping it did not bring back the wonderful historical dolls they archived, but at the very least, it brought us back to having full color illustrations, which we all appreciated. But I'm still mad that they made this Julie's outfit. This, what? what is she, a party city Halloween hippie? I just wanna yell sure Jan at her all day. And I'm also mad at Molly's Costco release. Where did Molly get those plastic frames for her glasses? She get them in the in the 1950s? She get them 10 years in the future? Huh? Thanks, I hate it. But perhaps what is, in my opinion, the biggest controversy of the 2010s is when American Girl released their first boy doll. Ooh. Who do you think was outraged about the boy doll? Was it A, conservatives because of the gender war or whatever? B, feminists because a boy doll would take away from the girl power message? No, guys, I'm just kidding. It's neither of those. The answer is C, everyone, and it was because of the face mold. In 2017, American Girl started releasing some contemporary characters as well. I have one of them. She's right here. Her name is Z, which is a nickname she goes by. Her full name is Suzanne. I love Z because she's all about filmmaking and she released right around the time I was starting to do a lot of writing about the importance of getting more women into directorial roles in the film industry. Z also used to host a show on the American Girl YouTube channel where she would teach girls the basics of filmmaking. And then in such a meta move, Z, who is a doll, who is animated by stop motion, in these videos would make her own stop motion videos with smaller dolls like this one. Z's book is also all about her directing her first movie and entering a film festival. It is super cute. I think it's just adorable. I love how she gets permits to film everywhere that she goes in public. That's just, that's just precious. Anyway, Z is my favorite doll from the contemporary line of 2017. Along with Z, they released a pair of best friends named Tenny and Logan. Tenny seemed to be a doll kind of loosely modeled after Taylor Swift, although that's never been officially confirmed, but she's a blonde girl who plays acoustic guitar and sings, and she's from Tennessee. She's also absolutely adorable. I love her brown eyes and her freckles, and Tenny's best friend, Logan, plays the drums along with her while she sings. Now, what's cool about Tenny and Logan is that American Girl created special hand molds for them since they're meant to hold guitars and drumsticks while they play music. I thought it was cool that they made that special about these dolls. Logan is the first boy doll ever released by American Girl. And for his face, they used a mold that they'd only ever used once before for one specific doll. Can you guess which doll that would be? If you're a reasonable person, you would never guess that they'd use this doll. It was Kaya. Kaya, the only indigenous doll, the doll to have her particular face mold. She's the only doll with that one. And then they used it for a white boy doll. Now, why is this a problem? Well, let's take a look at what people were saying about this. As the American Girl Wiki explains, there's considerable controversy in the fact that the Logan doll uses the Kaya mold. The mold was originally designed for the Kaya doll alone because of a cultural taboo in the Nimipu Nez Perce culture of bearing the teeth as it shows aggression. This not only removes the cultural impact, but it implies passively that Kaya's face is more masculine. Furthermore, no other native characters have been released but Kaya. A lot of people wondered, why would you use 
use this particular mold for a boy doll specifically. If they'd use a classic mold or even a Josefina mold, those molds have been used for so many dolls at this point that making a boy doll with that mold, like no one would blink an eye at that. But at this point, Kaya's mold had only been used once before and it was made specifically for her to match her indigenous heritage. If the mold wasn't meant to be made specific to indigenous characters, then why haven't they used the mold for any other dolls before now? And second, why is the first doll they use it for a boy? What is more masculine about this particular face mold than the others? And also, they literally made a new hand mold for Logan and Tenny. If they were going to go so far for these dolls already and to make them a new hand mold, why wouldn't they just make a boy face mold specific for that at that point, especially if they were going to make more boy dolls later in the future? Why use Kaya's face? So Logan did not go over particularly well. He was retired just one year later in 2018. The doll that Logan was paired with, Tenny, also had a few controversies of her own. YouTuber Ashley Norton did a fantastic job covering these controversies in detail, so I will link her video down below for you to watch as well. But the basics of the situation are, Tenny was a doll that seemed very close to Taylor Swift. But as far as we know, Taylor Swift herself has never expressed any opinion on this doll either way, so that's not even the controversy. The controversy is that Tenny was not Girl of the Year. See, every year so far, American Girl had been releasing one contemporary doll each year as the Girl of the Year, solidifying that year's place in American history. But Tenny and Logan were released as new contemporary dolls, a line that was canceled a year later, right when they would have stopped selling them for their Girl of the Year release anyway. So why wasn't Tenny Girl of the Year? The Girl of the Year for 2017 was Gabriella, a girl who loves dancing and spoken word poetry while also dealing with having a stutter. Gabriella was the first black girl of the year and she was also the first girl of the year to have a disability followed by Joss in 2020 who's half deaf. That sounds great, right? Well, many fans soon noticed that Gabriella's collection seemed a little rushed. Unlike the other girls of the year, her playsets seemed to be largely repurposed from other dolls. Plus, her doll itself wasn't even unique. She had the same exact face mold, hairstyle, and eye color combination of an existing Truly Me doll. It's almost as if Gabriella was rushed as a last minute thought. As if they intended for Tenny to be the girl of the year, you know, with her best friend release and her book already written and her extensive playsets with the guitars and her specialized hand mold, but then maybe they changed their mind after fans started complaining about them having too many white girls of a year in a row. As far as I could find, this has never been confirmed one way or the other, but it's a pretty well-established conspiracy theory within the fandom, at least and it's only been exacerbated by social media posts indicating a production for a movie about Tenny was in preparation and pre-production to happen when no such movie for Gabriella was ever announced or never even seemed to be planned. So make of that what you will. The following year's Girl of the Year faced her own controversy as well, this one even bigger. And this sucks because she's one of my favorite girls of the year. She's the first girl of the year I actually bothered to even get. Her name is Luciana. And she's a STEM girly who can't wait to go to space camp. She wants to be a rocket scientist. And she came with elaborate play sets that would make nerdy girls everywhere just absolutely foam at the mouth. But Luciana's release was met with allegations. The possibility that American Girl had plagiarized her story. Well, not plagiarized in the writing of the book necessarily, that book was very well done by a very skilled author, but they were worried that they'd based her story on a real person without said person's permission. That real life person in question is non-binary astronomer Lucianne Walkovich. As the magazine then reported back in July of 2020, the doll sports a similar purple streak of color in its hair, holographic boots, even a nearly identical first name, Luciana. The doll's surname, however, is Vega. Some were at first convinced that Luciana was simply the younger, official doll version of the real-life Lucianne. One longtime friend glanced at the company's January-February 2018 catalog while flipping through the mail. It was not just the superficial details of this doll, they tell me in one of the only interviews they've granted on the subject, it was also career details. They tend to keep busy with other projects. They rank among the most widely seen figures in science today. As a TED senior fellow and an astronomer at Chicago's Adler Planetarium, Walkovich's many lectures reach an audience of millions. They often touch on two prominent themes, the ethics of Mars exploration and findings from NASA's Kepler mission, which focused on a northern region of the sky with the constellation Lyra at its center. 
Vega, a name Welkovich has publicly uttered many times, happens to be the brightest star in that constellation. American Girl describes the Vega doll as having a head for science and a heart set on exploring Mars. To Lucianne, it seemed to go beyond mere coincidence. That I am aware there is no one who works on the Kepler field and Mars exploration at the same time, except for this doll, apparently. Discussions with the company were unproductive, says their lawyer, Charles Lee Mudd Jr. Mudd filed a legal trademark lawsuit for his client in late April. In the complaint, Welkovich alleges that the toy maker copied their likeness without authorization. The lawsuit requests that Mattel, American Girl's parent company, stop selling the doll. The message seems to be, go out, make a unique identity for yourself in STEM, be creative, and we'll turn around and steal your identity from you, Mudd says. When the Luciana Vega doll was released, it earned glowing praise as a role model encouraging girls to reach for the stars, per a news article in CNN, one of many positive stories following the doll's release. Such coverage described the doll as part of the broader cultural impetus to inspire young women to pursue careers in fields like astronomy. That's why, in addition to sinking damages, Walkovich hopes the pending lawsuit might teach American Girl executives a lesson about consent. It's a really bad example for little kids, they said. I can't think of anything less empowering for gender minorities in STEM than having your identity taken without your permission and used to sell a commercial product. Apparently, sometime in 2021, the lawsuit settled out of court. I can't find the details of the settlement, and as far as I know, it's unknown whether real-life Lucienne ever received payment for the use of their likeness. I really can't share any opinion on this because, like the rest of the public, I don't have any access to information about how this suit was actually resolved. We're going to head into the decade of the 2020s in just a moment, so since we're in a section full of controversies, I will end this section with one final controversy, one that took place in the 2020s, a debacle over the 2021 Girl of the Year, Kira having lesbian ants. Kira, the 2021 Girl of the Year, loves animals and wants to work with wildlife in Australia. In her book, as two background characters, we meet her aunts who get married to one another. That's it. That's what happens. I'm actually shocked that conservatives got outraged over this since it would have required them to actually open the book to even learn this little side fact about Kira in the first place, but somehow they did. For the first time ever, the anti-LGBTQ crowd bothered to open a book, and it did not go well. As the advocate reported in February of 2021, the latest target of One Million Moms is American Girl. The socially conservative advocacy group created by the American Family Association, designated a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, is calling for a boycott of the toy company due to its 2021 Girl of the Year doll, which was named after Kira Bailey, a 10-year-old from Michigan with lesbian great aunts. The doll includes an explainer on how Bailey's great aunts, who operate an animal sanctuary in Australia, were finally allowed to marry when the law changed there in 2017. Look at that! American Girl was doing something good. Good. Using a girl of the year to comment on the specific era that she represents. For example, we learned that gay marriage was allowed in Australia starting in 2017, and as a result, Kira's aunts can get married. That's putting the child right in the center of history, right in the moment. Great job! But one million moms didn't think so. As the advocate continues, the homophobic Christian organization deemed the story unacceptable, saying, as Christians, we know that even though something is legalized, that doesn't make it moral or right. One million moms is calling on parents to not buy the Kira doll for their daughters to avoid having a premature conversation that she is far too young to understand about women who are married. I'm sorry, is marriage too advanced of a topic for kids? Because then we better get rid of Samantha, who's first released in 1986, who attends her uncle guard's wedding to Aunt Cornelia because weddings are inappropriate for kids, I guess. Marriage is a mature sexual topic, and Aunt Cornelia is a suffragette, so we better not start indoctrinating these kids with feminism, or is it only sexual when two women marry each other? And if so, why? Why are two women more inherently sexual to you than one woman? Could it be because you view women as sexual? And if so, interrogate that about yourself for a little while and then get back to me. But those were the main controversies that American Girl faced, wrapping up as we head into the 2020s. So now, let's talk about the 2020s and the releases of their new historical dolls, both the good and the disastrous. The 2020s. 
Courtney and Claudie. There have been four historical dolls released in the decade of the 2020s so far. Two of them are absolutely fantastic, and two of them make me seethe with rage. First, we'll talk about the girls that rock, Claudie and Courtney. I've got Claudie here in her winter coat. She's about to head into the final round of the American Girl Holiday Fit Tournament that I've been running on my Instagram, where she will compete against Samantha in the final round for the championship. The story of how Claudie came to be is actually pretty fascinating. I'll link the Smithsonian story in the description below if you want to read the whole thing, which I highly recommend, but here are some highlights. As the article reports, when best-selling author Britt Bennett posted a tweet calling for American Girl, the beloved toy company, to debut a new Black character, she didn't expect her request please let me write it, to gain much traction. But Bennett's tweet in late 2020 caught the attention of the American Girl team, spurring lots of conversations in-house and then with Brit, as Jody Goldberg, the company's senior director of content development, tells Publishers Weekly. Now, after two years of collaboration between Bennett, American Girl, and a panel of outside experts, the author's spur-of-the-moment proposal has culminated in the release of Claudie Wells, a black doll whose story is set in 1922 at the height of the Harlem Renaissance. Claudie is the fourth black doll in American Girl's historical line. She was preceded by Addie Walker, a character who es escaped slavery during the Civil War, Cecile Ray, a resident of 1850s New Orleans whose collection was retired in 2014, just three years after its release, and Melody Ellison, an aspiring singer who comes of age in the tumult of the 1960s civil rights movement. Addie and Melody are both stories of racial struggle, bookended by slavery on the one side and civil rights on the other, Zaslow said. There's been a call for the story of an African-American girlhood that's not filled with struggle, like a Harlem Renaissance doll that's just focused on joy, art, and music. Currently, American Girl doesn't have a story that focuses on the African-American experience as something to just be celebrated and not something to be thought of as pain and strife. American Girl enthusiasts and casual fans alike celebrated Claudie's release on social media, alternatively praising the doll as an example of why representation matters and calling attention to the fact that fans who have been asking for a Harlem Renaissance doll for years. Now, Claudie is one of my favorite dolls of all time. I got her at my 30th birthday celebration, which was, of course, at the American Girl store, where I brought 15 people along with me, all between the ages of 27 and 65, no kids. And I was so happy that I was able to get Claudie, this absolutely gorgeous girl with a gorgeous story to tell. Let's take a look at Claudie's book. On page four, we instantly get hit with a beautiful description description of the setting, putting us in Claudie's time and place. She loved Harlem in the summertime. She loved riding past ladies in bright dresses, children playing marbles in the front of their stoops, a street magician dazzling a small crowd with a card trick on the corner. She loved the rush of air as she zigged and zagged around parked cars and carts, past storefronts and cafes and men hauling crates into shops. We get to the central conflict of the book. Claudia wants to figure out what she's good at. She's just come from dance class where her friend Nina is a much better dancer than she is, and Claudia lives in a boarding house filled with musicians, artists, and all kinds of wonderful creative people. But Claudie hasn't figured out what she's best at yet. We learn that Claudie's mother is a reporter who works for a newspaper and that she's planning a trip down to Georgia to visit their extended family. Claudie really wants to go on this trip with her, but her mom tells her to wait until she's older. Claudie visits others in the boarding house, trying to figure out what has helped each person spark their own passion and seeing if it will help her to find her own. First, she meets with a singer named Selma and learns how she was always passionate about music, but meanwhile, Claudie knows she isn't a very good singer, so she doesn't think that's going to be for her. She visits Miss Amelia, the owner of the boarding house, a skilled seamstress, and talks to her about developing her passion for sewing. Claudie then goes to visit her mother at work, where she sees her mom writing an article, but her mom doesn't show her what she's writing. When Claudie asks her mom about it, her mom explains to her that she's writing an article about a black man who was recently lynched. Claudie asks her mom what lynching is, and her mom explains it to her. What's wonderful about Claudie is that her story focuses so much on black excellence, on black communities, and the art that they create but it also shows Claudie learning about the ways that racism is still such a powerful force in the world around her. On page 25, we get this absolutely lovely exchange between Claudie and her mother. Why do you keep writing these stories? Claudie asked. Wouldn't you rather write about nice things? Because sometimes, Mama said, we have to help people see what they would rather ignore. So next, Claudie visits her dad at the bakery to try to help him bake. But she soon learns that baking is not her talent either. She visits a trumpet player named Porter and tries out the trumpet herself, and again, it's not her thing. But from Porter, she learns about jazz music, what it means to improvise, and how Porter is from New Orleans, where he first fell in love with jazz. Claudie also talks to her friend Winston, who was born in Mississippi. When she asks him why he moved here, he tells her, you can be who you want in Harlem. He explains to her how in a lot of parts of the country, Black Americans 
students don't have equal opportunities to pursue their dreams, but that in Harlem, it's different. And then Miss Amelia gets an eviction notice. Everyone in the boarding house is so stressed because they do not want to move out. And that's when Claudie gets a fantastic idea because her boarding house is filled with so many talented people. What if they put on a variety show to raise money to save the boarding house? The other tenants of the boarding house are all in favor of Claudie's idea, but they also want Claudie to perform a talent of her own. Claudie still hasn't figured out what her talent is, and one of the boarders in the house suggests she could try writing a sketch, writing a little play, or a scene. Claudie can't figure out what exactly it is she wants to write, so she goes to her mother for inspiration. And that's when she realizes she really wants to go along with her mom on this trip to Georgia. She needs to see more of the world and meet more of her family if she wants to become a writer. So Claudie's mom agrees to take her to Georgia, and that is where book one ends. Book two is about their trip. Book two came out recently. I have it, but I haven't read it yet, and I'm really excited to read it in the future. Much like the peek into the past sections from the older historical girls, Claudie's book has a section in the back all about life during the Harlem Renaissance. Claudie's book, in my opinion, gets the closest to the experience and the spirit of the original historical dolls. Just look at this girl, her outfits. Her outfits are just absolutely gorgeous. I love the 1920s style dresses she has, and I love her play sets, how she has a bedroom and a bakery as the set where her dad works. Now, I don't have any of her furniture yet, but I'm hoping to get some before I build a giant dollhouse, which is something I hope to do maybe next year or the year after. The other girl, released in the 2020s, was Courtney. I got my girl Courtney with me here. She is in a fun 80s inspired Christmas outfit that I bought for her on Etsy. Courtney is one of my favorite dolls and in my opinion one of the best dolls released in the past decade along with Claudie. Courtney's story takes place in 1986. Now when Courtney was first announced a lot of people were like 1986 that is not historical and then people pointed out well when American Girl as the company first started in the 80s they had Molly who was a doll from 1944 and you know the 2020s are equally as far from the 1980s as the 1980s are from the 1940s. And then everyone had a massive existential crisis and cried. From the surface, Courtney's collection might look like it's just capitalizing on 80s nostalgia as a way to hook in the parents of current children. And in a way, sure, you could say that some aspects of it are doing that. Courtney loves Pac-Man, for example, and they have a doll-sized Pac-Man machine that you can get her. It's back there. I got it myself a couple years ago. You can really play Pac-Man on it. So it's like having an arcade in your home to play video games with your dolls, and that's what I like to do. I'm gonna briefly go over Courtney's first book, but her second book is where I really want to focus today. Even though Courtney incorporates 80s nostalgia, she's about a lot more than just the brands. She's also about the social issues of the 80s. In Courtney's first book, we learn a few things about her. We learn that her parents are divorced, that she has a stepsister, that she loves having curly hair, and that her mom is running for mayor. We also learn that Courtney loves, once again, nerdy stuff like video games and science and space. Courtney wants to see more women in space and she loves the idea of having more female video game characters. And Courtney has a role model in her life. She has a woman that she idolizes, a woman she looks up to. And this woman is a teacher turned astronaut named Krista McAuliffe. If you remember the 80s, you know exactly where this is going and I am so sorry. Yes, one day Courtney's in class the teacher wheels the little wheelie cart TV into classroom one morning in January. Courtney is so pumped to see Krista McAuliffe, her hero, finally go into space on a rocket called the Challenger. Spoiler alert for actual American history, uh, the Challenger explodes. Courtney watches her role model die in front of her on a wheelie cart classroom TV. That's probably what's most memorable about book one. So we already know that Courtney's books, well, yeah, they have Pac-Man and Care Bears and other fun 80s stuff. They're also not playing around. We're getting a look at the realities of the 1980s here. Book two is where I think this comes through most clearly. Book two is called Courtney, Friendship Superhero, and it's about Courtney making a new friend named Isaac while playing Pac-Man at the mall. Isaac is fantastic at Pac-Man, and he has just moved to California recently because... He is HIV positive and medical misinformation has caused him to be cast out of his former school. Much like the real 1980s HIV activist Ryan White, Isaac became infected with HIV after a routine blood transfusion that he got for hemophilia. However, as a lot of us probably know, the mid to late 1980s was filled with massive misinformation about the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Much like something kind of similar that we're seeing now in the 2020s, 
Yeah, that's interesting. Let's take a look at Courtney's book. The book starts off with Courtney and her friends participating in Hands Across America, so already we're talking about important causes of the 80s. Soon, when Courtney makes her usual trip to the mall, she meets a new kid named Isaac who's really good at Pac-Man and is about to start going to her school. Courtney invites Isaac to a pool party, but he ends up having to go home when he gets a small cut that causes him to bleed a little. He also gets way more terrified about this cut than Courtney expects, and they call his mom, and Courtney's wondering if Isaac's okay. She and Isaac hang out at school but Isaac ends up having to miss a few days due to illness. Courtney goes to Isaac's house to check on him and they have this exchange on page 48. I do have hemophilia, but I have something else too. It's called HIV. It stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. Courtney nodded slowly, trying to remember what she had heard about HIV on the news. Right now, HIV makes me sick on and off, Isaac continued. Eventually, it will turn into AIDS. A chill shot through Courtney. We talked about AIDS in class as a current event topic. People can die from it. Everyone who gets it dies from it, Isaac replied softly. There is no cure. Isaac then promises Courtney that he won't die until he at least beats level 10 of Donkey Kong Jr., not kidding. Then he explains to her how he got infected with HIV. I got a bad cut last year and lost a lot of blood. I had to go to the hospital and get a blood transfusion and the blood I got was infected with HIV. Is your family gonna get sick too? She asked quietly. You can't catch HIV like you can a cold or flu, Mr. Wells answered. HIV doesn't spread when an infected person coughs or sneezes. So then something really terrible happens. Some parents at their school learn that Isaac has HIV and they start protesting that he shouldn't be at school with them because he could infect all the other kids. Their efforts get noticed and eventually printed in the local newspaper. So now Isaac's HIV status becomes public knowledge for the entire school. When Courtney goes to school the day after the newspaper comes out, she is suddenly met with a wave of people completely misunderstanding Isaac's condition. On page 62 get this exchange. Courtney heard someone mentioned Isaac's name. He's in Ms. Markarian's class, one of them said. I heard that the janitors had to scrub the room with bleach. Totally, another kid agreed, snapping his gum. And the desk he sat at? They took it out of the room. I think they're gonna burn it or something. Courtney's face flushed red. She wanted to run away from the rumors about her friend, but then she pictured Crystal Starshooter. That's the video game character that she creates and imagines herself being. That, that, that's her own character, her, her OC. She draws it in her school notebooks. So she imagined Crystal Shar Shooter. Her emblem was a heart with a lightning bolt through it, a symbol that Crystal was kind and brave. Courtney knew that if Crystal were here, she wouldn't run. She'd boldly speak the truth from her heart. Courtney squared her shoulders and turned to the older group of kids. I'm in Miss Markarian's class, she said. None of what you guys are saying is true. It's not dangerous to be in a room that Isaac Wells was in. You can't get HIV by touching something he touched. And this is Courtney's first experience of standing up to people who are older and bigger than she is. It's her first experience having to overcome her fears in favor of learning to do the right thing. Courtney decides that for her school presentation, she's gonna give a talk called Spread Facts, Not Fear. She has her dad take her to the library where she does a ton of research about HIV and AIDS and then prepares to give a speech to her class about debunking medical misinformation. This book, published in 2021, teaches kids about about fighting medical misinformation at a time when pandemics and viruses have become politicized. Imagine the conversations that this book is sparking between parents and kids about finding the facts about COVID, about learning to trust real medical sources and not conspiracy theories about vaccines. Courtney's book doesn't get enough credit whatsoever for how brilliant it really is. So there's a lot more fantastic stuff that goes on in this book. I encourage that you read it. The back of the book, the what used to be called a peek into the past, but is now called Inside Courtney's world, this section is also fantastic. It includes lines like, because many of the earliest patients were gay men, a lot of people wrongly saw AIDS as a gay disease, but AIDS impacted all kinds of people. As doctors and scientists work tirelessly to understand the illness, they learned that AIDS could only be spread through close contact with bodily fluids such as blood, not by casual contact. And lines like this. Many politicians, including President Ronald Reagan, did not support funding to study the illness or develop treatment. This book really said Ronald Reagan didn't do shit. But it wasn't until the end of 2022 that Matt Walsh's family and all the other conservative influencers realized that these books were too political because they mentioned trans people on one page. Yet this book, which came out a whole year before that one, states on the page that Ronald Reagan was a 
deadbeat when it came to handling the AIDS crisis, but the brand was never political before they mentioned trans people existing, right? It's because the outrage mob doesn't actually read. Then the book gives us a little biography of Ryan White, the boy whose life story Isaacs is loosely based on. Now these dolls, Claudia and Courtney, they are exactly, in my opinion, what the American Girl brand has always been about. Putting you, the reader, in the center of history. Understanding how you and your very normal childhood wants, needs, your playfulness, rebelliousness, and everything else all fit into a wider context of your time period, just like it does for the girls of the past. But Claudia and Courtney seem to be more of the exception rather than the rule. Because especially during the 2020s, American Girl has been going through a process that many of its adult fans refer to not so lovingly as Barbiefication. As the Dolls of Our Lives book says on page 57, one night in Williamsburg, we attended a ghost tour. For years, Williamsburg wouldn't offer them, thinking such flights of imagination might affect its dedication to authenticity. After all, if you offer ghost tours and sell magnets of a cartoon Ben Franklin and his BFFs, how can anyone take you seriously? However, the popularity of ghost tours offered by other vendors in the town pushed Colonial Williamsburg to create its own official ghost tours. What's fascinating is how well this parallels the barbification of American Girl. Pleasant Roland never wanted the dolls to be living in the future. She wanted to portray an accurate vision of American history, or at least as accurate of a version as was possible. But with the 2020s, with two full decades of American Girl being owned by Mattel, we've started to see American Girl offering ghost tours of their own. But instead of ghost tours, it's a pink convertible, like what Barbie might drive. Never mind that Barbie exists between the ages of 17 to 35, depending on whether she's babysitting Skipper or running for president. And American Girl dolls have been age 13 maximum in some of of their girl of the year books but are usually nine to ten years old but yeah let's make a remote control convertible that's scaled for them to drive or how about a hogwarts collection because kids love harry potter right doesn't matter that harry potter is british not american nor that it's a fantasy series with magic and no ties to real history i mean it would be one thing if your character like had a hogwarts halloween costume or that like you played with your character going but, but your character riding a real train to hogwarts your character actually going to wizard school? I guess it's just profitable to sell wizard stuff. Or what about a set of Disney princesses like Jasmine, who lives in roughly the area we now see as Saudi Arabia and has never been to the US, or Belle, who lives in France and has an explicitly French story and has never been to the US, or Rapunzel, who's an absolutely gorgeous doll. This doll's an absolute work of art and visually one of the most beautiful dolls I've ever seen, but is also European, also from a fairy tale, also magical and not set in real history, and also has never been to the US. Or what about this pretty girl, who kind of looks like Galadriel from Lord of the Rings, who retails for close to $300? Or what about the coffee shop set, where your American Girl doll can work as a barista? Or the juice bar, where your American Girl doll can work as a cashier? I'm sorry, didn't Samantha fight against child labor? And now, we want to bring it back? Where are the conservative talking heads congratulating these moves? It's political to bring up the LGBTQ community, but it's not political to watch the brand slip into the reactionary notion of involving kids in capitalism as early as possible. Matt Walsh, this one's for you. The American Girl airplane, where you can force a 10-year-old to work as your flight attendant. Or the American Girl ice cream truck, where you can put a 10-year-old in the driver's seat of what the liberal regulators of the free market want to call a violation of commercial driver's license laws. Isn't that exactly what you've been waiting for? Why why are you boycotting this when the brand is in its prime of late stage capitalism? Everything wrong with the 90s twins. While Claudia and Courtney, two of the historical dolls released this decade, have been fantastic for addressing issues within US history and inviting readers to draw those connections to the current events they're facing now, the 90s twins are the worst examples of cheap nostalgia bait that I've ever seen. Disclaimer, the 90s twins are adorable, and if you like playing with them, have fun. You do you. I'm not your mom. I even bought Nikki's Skater Girl outfit and the twins' desktop computer set, which I use for Kit's broadcasting studio when I have her report the news and some of my stop motion skits. But when it comes to the core of the brand, of introducing kids to American history in ways that they can understand, helping them draw those connections between the past and the present, these twins are just absolute 
failures. Let's do a quick review of their book called Meet Isabel and Nikki, and then I'm going to tell you what I think would have made this book better. First, I don't like that their names are Isabel and Nikki, mainly because American Girl has already used Isabel and Nikki for names of past girls of the year. I imagine they just weren't allowed to call them what they really wanted to, Mary Kate and Ashley, but if we're going for names that represent the era in the way we have Courtney for the 80s, why couldn't we name them like Brittany and Jennifer? I'm just saying, name the dolls something representative of the era that aren't already the names of other dolls you've already released. Anyway, on to their book. Meet Isabel and Nikki has a few things going for it. First, it's illustrated in full color, which is a massive improvement over the hot mess that was Be Forever. It's also written by a pair of actual twins, which is cool. Like a lot of these books, the back of the book talks about the book's advisory board. Now, in the past, a lot of these advisory boards are in place to make sure the book's issues are handled with care and accuracy, like making sure that Addie's narrative of escaping slavery was treated with the specificity needed for educational purposes, but also presented in a way that would make young black girls able to relate to the character rather than being traumatized by her. Similarly, Kaya's books had a board of advisors to make sure that American Girl properly portrayed the Nez Perce culture and accurately represented life as an indigenous girl in the 18th century. On a more recent level, Kavi, the 2023 Girl of the Year, has ADHD, and her book includes a board of advisors specializing in childhood neurodivergence. What did the board of advisors do for Meet Isabel and Nikki? Well, we have someone who was a skater girl in the 90s, someone who studies 90s pop culture, someone who is an expert on Seattle in the 90s, someone who is an expert in technology, I guess because we're going to talk about Y2K. Not gonna lie, it kind of feels like they added an advisory board as an afterthought just so that they could make this book feel like it's as important and historically relevant as the other ones. But let's get into the book. The book starts off with the twins going to Blockbuster to check out a VHS tape of The Parent Trap because it's also about twins in the 90s, but the VHS release isn't coming until next Next month that I guess they weren't allowed to check out a Mary Kate and Ashley movie because then it would be obvious how much of a Mary Kate and Ashley knockoff these dolls are. Rad! Then Isabel sees her friend in the video store and says your platforms are da bomb to her. Then we learn of the conflict going on at home which is that Isabel and Nikki's mom works as a computer programmer and she needs to fix a ton of bugs before Y2K happens which is kind of a hilarious plot and it's clearly written for adults. Like I was a kid in 1999 and unless you had a parent working in the tech sector you probably were weren't thinking that much about Y2K, or maybe that was just me. I don't know. Maybe your little nine-year-old brain was consumed with all these visions of how the computers were going to shut down with the date changes, but I couldn't afford internet until 2000, so I was mostly just removed from Y2K, although I love that we do get an episode of Seventh Heaven where Ruthie makes friends with a Y2K truther at school who gets a whole doomsday prepper arc, uh, but that's just one episode. There's a big Seattle New Year's celebration that's about to happen to ring in the year 2000, and Nikki and Isabel's friends want them to perform a dance during the kids portion of the program so they all start gushing about the Spice Girls and then dad rolls up with the 1960s parent trap starring Haley Mills instead of Lindsay Lohan the one that they really wanted and then the twins buy baby bottle pops at the checkout counter. We're one chapter in and so far this book has so much product placement it feels like Red Letter Media's analysis of Jack and Jill as Adam Sandler's biggest money laundering scheme. We'll, we'll put together this this really cheaply made product called Jack and Jill. Yeah. Um, I can raise this budget for it, X amount of dollars, get giant checks from big name advertisers to also give us money. We'll cash all these paychecks and we'll release this bomb to the theaters. <laughs> and who gives a shit what the critics say. Then the girls celebrate Hanukkah in chapter two, and then in chapter three, which is called Countdown to Y2K, Isabel is obsessing over her new gel pens while she plans out a baby spice costume for New Year's Eve. Guys, I get it. Courtney's book had Pac-Man and shit too, but they were also about things, like her parents being divorced, her mom running for mayor, the Challenger explosion, and the AIDS epidemic. So far, this book has just been throwing brands in my face nonstop. I feel like I'm in Demia Dijuibe's rejected theme song from Ready Player One. Remember Tomb Raider, remember Weird Science, remember Battletoads and the Iron Giant, remember Star Wars and Transformers the movie, remember Ghostbusters, remember the Goonies. Then we get the twins' main plot of the book, which is that they make a list of things to do before the millennium ends, which is kind of a cute idea. Their 10 goals are pretty vague. Some of the things on their list are great goals like conquer a fear or write a letter to your future self. Those are cool challenges. But some of them are just completely vague non-goals like love your look or dance like it's 1999. What do you mean? dance like it's 1999. It is 1999. Any dancing you do would count for that. Then their friends come over to practice their dance and Isabel is currently baking brownies in an Easy Bake Oven. Remember Easy Bake Ovens? Remember them? And then the brownies turn out awful so instead they go to get a snack called and I quote 
Doritos 3Ds. Remember Doritos 3Ds? Remember? I feel like I'm in Back to the Future going, hey, give me a Pepsi free. If you want a Pepsi, pal, you're gonna pay for it. Except the entire book is just that joke over and over and over. The next few pages I had to skim because it's just insufferable arguing about which girls are going to be which Spice Girl and I couldn't take it. And then a new conflict arises when their friend Quinn, the one whose platforms are the bomb, announces that she now likes in sync and is ready to sing bye 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 to their Spice Girls dance routine. And then another friend announces that she has a crush on Lance Bass, which is fucking weird because these dolls famously never have any interest in anyone, which is why they're such an icon for queer girls. But I guess choosing Lance Bass was good because he's the gay one at least. So then Isabel is convinced that if they get Nikki to join their dance routine, they'll have the right number to be the Spice Girls and her friends will forget about stupid in sync. But Nikki doesn't like performing in front of crowds. Good thing she has conquer a fear on her goals list. Yeah, I have advanced enough reading comprehension to understand a book targeted at tweens. They want Nikki to be sporty spice because she's a skater girl and Isabel isn't ready to say see you later girl to the spicy routine. Is me talking this way getting annoying yet? This is what the entire book is like but worse. Then I think Nikki has this lesbian awakening on pages 29 to 30 but it's also not clear. Nikki does a cool skateboard trick and then this grunge girl in a flannel shirt walks up to her and tells her how cool it looked. On page 30 it says Nikki's heart raced. From her worn out shoes and board it was clear that this girl was a real shredder. One of the kids who skated in the park and did tricks. Why would she want to talk to me? Nikki was about to make her escape but she remembered number five on the countdown list. Make a new friend. To have any chance of finishing the list on her own before New Year she had to get started now. Nikki's heart pounded. She blurted out a greeting. Hey, what's up? So then Nikki is just like sweating profusely, fully experiencing her first crush right here. Like she's has to keep reminding herself, play it cool. There's one point where Nikki falls off her skateboard and then the other girl grabs her hand to help her up and pull her to her feet. And they have this moment and like Nikki's troubles all just float away. Now, I guess you could read the scene as not gay. Like you could read this as Nikki just really wants to impress a cool skater girl. But I'd like to remind you all how American Girl themselves defined the feeling of having a crush back in 2001 in their dating advice book, which I reviewed on this channel last year. And then it says here, you'll know you have a crush on a boy if being near him feels a little like the flu. And then it basically, in here, it, it just goes into it. It goes all, palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy, vomit on your sweater already, mom's spaghetti. That's how you know you have a crush on someone. So then Nikki's new girl crush introduces her to skateboarding zines, so we know she's definitely queer as fuck. And then Nikki goes home where Isabel bribes her with a baby bottle pop to be part of the Spice Girls dance routine, so we're back to brand bombardment. And Nikki says no, because strawberry isn't even her favorite baby bottle pop flavor. Then the group of friends all play truth or dare, and Isabel gets dared to play some a prank called a Pizza Hut. In the next chapter, we have a reference to the girls wanting to get on the internet, but they can't because their dad is using the phone, which I think is actually a great detail for setting the story in that time period. That's a real like late 90s and early 2000s experience, but without all the excessive branding. But it doesn't last long because when Nikki tells Isabel she's agreeing to be in their New Year's dance routine, Isabel is so shocked that she literally spits out her Sunny D. Remember Sunny D? Remember it? Anyway, the other girls in the dance group kick Isabel out because she's not a good enough dancer and they got a cool older fifth grade girl to dance with them instead and the cool older girl said that Isabel sucks. So Isabel's out of the group and she's super sad. She goes home and decides to upgrade her in Nikki's bedroom so that the fifth grade girl will think that she's cool and let her back into the dance. But Nikki gets home and hates how Isabel changed their room so she gets super angsty and goes to listen to No Doubt while she cools off. Then they go thrift shopping at a vintage store where a girl teaches them the word aesthetic. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Then Nikki goes skateboarding with a kid named Shredward who gives her the nickname Tricky Nikki after she does a trick. Later at school, Isabel apologizes to Nikki for redecorating the bedroom without her permission and they hug and then later Nikki falls off her skateboard and gets hurt. I've completely forgotten how Y2K is supposed to fit into any of this. Anyway, the girls dye their hair together and then on page 87, Nikki proclaims that the room was so messy that she found Isabel's Spice World CD in the closet with a fruit roll up stuck to it. Remember Spice World? Remember Remember fruit roll-ups? Comparing this book to Dolls of Our Lives, which is also jam-packed with millennial media references, that book has the positive of weaving in real American history with those references and drawing direct parallels between those references and the evolution of the American Girl brand. So far, this book has been almost 
all references with like two brief mentions of Y2K, which was supposed to be the plot. On top of that, keep in mind that Dolls of Our Lives is a nonfiction book targeted specifically at millennials who still love their dolls, like people like me. This book, Meet Isabel and Nikki, is listed as having a third to fourth grade reading level, meaning it's meant for kids who are currently eight to 10 years old, who would have been born between 2012 and 2015. This is not meant for kids who have any memory of the references that are being discussed. It's like they took those funny jokes for parents that are in the background of kids shows to keep the parents invested, but then they made the entire book just that. On page 89, we finally get back to Y2K. Nikki was thinking a lot about the moment when 1999 would turn to 2000. What would happen to the computers? Would planes still be able to fly? So Nikki, I've got bad news for you about where things with planes are going. Uh, sixth grade is gonna be a rough year for you, girl, sorry. Then in the next chapter, their dad tells them that some furniture from the vintage store just needs a little TLC. And Isabel says, like the band. And the dad explains that it means tender loving care. Here, I'm gonna rewrite that scene for a 2012 historical doll that's gonna release 20 years from now. It just needs a little TLC. Like the channel where I watch the Duggar family and here comes Honey Boo Boo? No, you silly Gen Z goober. It means tender loving care. But back when I was your age, I thought it was referring to the band famous for their 1999 hit No Scrubs. The girls then celebrate Christmas because I guess they're half Christian, half Jewish, which could be a super interesting plot to delve into and get into those nuances there. But they decide they'd rather just fill the book with cliche 90s references over and over and over again. So instead, we don't get any introspection from these girls about battling to religious identities, like what we got in Judy Bloom's 1970s hit, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. Then the girls end up redecorating their room into the room that's available to buy as their place at which I won't lie, it's a really cool room. Then the girls go to the top of the Space Needle to conquer a fear together so they can check another item off their list. And then Nikki finishes her girl power zine. And then the Seattle New Millennium celebration is canceled. And here's how their parents explain it to them on page 118. Why would they cancel it? Isabel asked. It's because of Y2K, isn't it? Nikki said. Y2K does have people a little nervous, Mom said, but I promise you have nothing to worry about on that front. Then what's the reason? Isabel demanded. The mayor decided it wasn't a good idea to have a big gathering on such an important night, Dad explained. He's being extra cautious to keep people safe. That is the entire explanation we get. So then the girls decide to throw their own big New Year's party at their dad's coffee shop, which seems really cool and fun. The girls still worry about Y2K, but they dance to Nikki's No Doubt CD until their troubles melt away. Then they have a fun New Year's party at the coffee shop and Nikki shares some song lyrics she wrote and isn't scared in front of the crowd anymore. And then no Y2K disasters happen in the end. Now, if you're a nine-year-old kid yourself reading this book, you might be like, wait, but why did the New Year's celebration get canceled? It's never actually explained. Thankfully, the Inside an Isabel and Nikki's world section in the back sort of explains it. First, you have to read through two pages about grunge fashion and what the World Wide Web means, but then you finally get to an explanation. It says, Seattle made global news in 1999 as tens of thousands of people protested during a World Trade Organization conference. Government representatives from around the world were meeting to discuss how trade happens and what the rules should be. The protesters were demanding better conditions for farmers and workers everywhere and more protection for the environment. Weeks later, Mayor Paul Schell canceled Seattle's New Year's Eve celebrations. The city was concerned about security at such a big gathering. And then it talks about how Seattle is known for Starbucks and Amazon. And then before that page is over, we're back to the Spice Girls. So why wasn't this woven into the story at all? Why didn't we hear about the protests or about the environmental concerns? Why didn't their parents give them any explanation beyond eh, security? And what 90s girl would accept that explanation without, as my mom called it, talking back, which of course is always going to get you yelled at. Also, this book completely ignores why the mayor was so concerned about security at a big event. He was worried about, about the T word terrorism. As an archived article from the December 28th, 1999 Washington Post says, the mayor has canceled the city's New Year's Eve celebration in the park below its landmark Space Needle, citing the possibility of terrorist acts in a city rattled by demonstrations and a border arrest. International media coverage of the event makes it impossible for federal officials to rule out the area as a terrorist target, he said. However, the mayor said federal officials have not advised him of any specific threat. The city's nerves were strained in recent weeks by sometimes violent protests during the World Trade Organization conference. And on December 14th, an Algerian man was arrested at Port Angeles and charged with smuggling nitroglycerin and other explosive materials across the border from Canada. Investigators said he had reserved a motel room near the Space Needle. In just under two years, Nikki and Isabel are about to experience 9-11, but this book couldn't even delve into the political tensions behind the New Year's Eve celebration getting cancelled. They just said that it was. That would be like if Courtney's book brushed off the Challenger explosion as, sorry kids, we can't watch it on TV because there's been technical difficulties. Or if 
if she just passively experienced the concept of HIV without ever knowing a kid who had it or having to stand up for him. Or like she just learned about the conceptual idea of medical misinformation without actually being willing to touch it and engage with it herself. My point is, this book is a barrage of product placement with just enough historical context woven into masquerade of being historical fiction quality. Unless this book is actually meant to be a dystopian tale about how brand obsessed the 90s was, it's a complete failure of a book. On the positive side, though, I will say that Nikki and Isabel's parents are both hot. Like, really hot. Like, sometimes a bisexual siren song just calls to you, and that happens when you look at the art of these parents. Good lord, I wouldn't mind being stuck in a Y2K doomsday prepper shelter with the two of them, if you know what I'm saying. Now, like I said, if you like the 90s twins, have fun playing with them. I like a lot of their collections, too. My point with all of this isn't that the 90s twins are bad. It, they're great in so many ways, from their elaborate play sets to their adorable faces to their iconic outfits. But they're also getting a lot more attention than some of the dolls who have strong educational value. While Claudie never even got a cover photo in the American Girl catalog, the twins have taken over the covers of the catalogs, gaining the cover story as soon as they released and instantly taking over American Girl store displays as the main attraction. The twins are cool, but they shouldn't be promoted at the expense of other dolls who have better educational value. And on top of that, I'm gonna say it, they played it safe. I'm not sure if it was a response to the conservative backlash at the end of 2022 or what, but these 90s girls are the most apolitical dolls I've ever seen, and that is a problem. Because if you just read the books of an 80s doll who loves Pac-Man and Care Bears and all the fun stuff of the 80s, but also watches her role model die in the Challenger explosion and then makes a friend with HIV, well, you'd assume these twins would be also using 90s nostalgia as bait to get to the meat of the story, which would be teaching kids about the real issues of 1999. Right? This is the equivalent of making a 2001 historical doll whose entire story is supposed to capture the biggest historical events of 2001, and it revolves around her going to see Shrek in the theaters. Guys, they're set in 1999. I'm Nikki and Isabel's age. These dolls are me in terms of age and timeline. Today, they'd currently also be in their early 30s like I am. So for people who are the same age as me and Nikki and Isabel, who remembers what changed the lives of kids going to public school in 1999 the way 9-11 changed airports forever in 2001? Who remembers being a kid in public school in 1999 just like Nikki and Isabel are? What happened in 1999 that had a direct effect on kids who were at the age to be going to school. No more time for guessing. The answer is Columbine. Brief history for those of you who aren't American. On April 20th, 1999, Columbine High School in Colorado was the site of a massacre where two very disturbed teens brought guns to school and killed 15 total people, including themselves, plus injured more than 20 others. It wasn't the first event of this type to happen, but it is notable for a few reasons. First, it set off a wave of these things happening in schools that have continued to happen since. While gun violence in schools before 1999 did happen occasionally, the tragedies happened like once to twice per decade, if that. While since Columbine, multiple events of these types have happened every single year in the 24 years that followed. After Columbine, there were three more events of this type before the end of 1999, followed by six in 2000, and it just keeps going every year until now, where we've had seven in the year of 2023 alone, following six in 2022 and eight in 2021. The only year that doesn't have any is 2020, and that's because most schools were closed down or operating remotely due to the COVID pandemic. But as soon as schools reopened in 2021, there were eight. As security.org reports, according to the K-12 you know, that that thing database, a publication of the Naval Postgraduate Center for the Homeland Defense and Security, a total of 118 incidents have been reported at K-12 schools in the U.S. since 1999. 1999 was the year that kicked off a massive rise in childhood school violence, one that children today are still dealing with. That is the impact of 1999, not fake Y2K conspiracies, not a New Year celebration that you can't even bother to explain to us why it didn't happen. Now, I'm not saying that Isabel and Nikki should have necessarily been the victims of this type of tragedy, not at all, just that the book should have addressed it. Maybe they have an older cousin who knows someone who was hurt. At the very least, the schools would have been talking about it. If you were in school at this time, like me, 
You might remember the rumor that went around saying that the re reason that Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold murdered so many people is that they were just snapping after being bullied too hard. And then as a result, schools started giving us anti-bullying assemblies every month, inundating us with constant anti-bullying training that never accomplished anything. And TV shows started producing after school specials one after the next about why we shouldn't bully people. Never did anyone try to combat the misinformation that bullying is what actually causes the violence. I'm saying there's no way that Isabel and Nikki would have gone to school in 1999 without being slapped in the face with anti-bullying messaging at every turn, nor would they have been able to avoid constant lectures on why guns are bad from their teachers and authority figures. There is absolutely no way that they wouldn't get caught up when in the debate about gun control or watch their friends' families get torn apart arguing about Second Amendment rights versus the importance of regulating gun ownership. These dolls are supposed to be historical. They're supposed to represent the late 90s as a period of American history. And instead of addressing any of the issues that were front and center in the 90s, issues that we're still facing today that could open up extremely important discussions among kids, parents, and teachers about how to navigate the controversies still existing in the world around them, instead, we have fruit roll-ups stuck to Spice World CDs. And those are the dolls that American Girl is currently pushing the hardest. Those are the ones who have the most product placement, the ones with the most brand collabs. I guess I'll give them a few points for historical accuracy and representing post-Reaganomics America as a true capitalist hellscape, if only the book wasn't actually glorifying it so hard. This makes me wonder if the authors are just too close to the subject matter. When American Girl Dolls first came out, nobody who was writing a book about Kirsten in 1985 actually could have lived in 1850s Minnesota. Nobody who wrote about Felicity in 1990 could have actually been alive during the American Revolution. And even Molly's book, which was written in 1985 to 86, could theoretically have been written by someone who lived through World War II, but it wasn't. It was written by Valerie Tripp, who was born in 1951, seven years after Molly's book takes place. The original books were written by people who didn't live through these events themselves. They were written by authors who looked at the past with a historian's lens rather than a personal one. But now we have dolls from more recent history. It's extremely easy to find an author who remembers seeing the Challenger explosion to write Courtney's book. And similarly, not only is it extremely easy to find someone who lived through the 90s to write a book about them, but the overwhelming majority of people who are old enough to be writing and publishing books are also old enough to remember at least some of the 90s. It would be harder to find an author who doesn't remember the 90s. It wasn't that long ago. This book was written by twins who from their author bio pictures look to be not that much older than I am, meaning they probably lived through roughly the same experiences as Nikki and Isabel and I did. Which is why I'm wondering if maybe authors like this are just too close to the events to cover them. Of course they're gonna fill the book with Spice Girls references and the exact brand names of the snacks they ate. That's what they remember from those years. It's probably impossible for them not to think of the 90s that way. But let's keep in mind the target customers. Kids. Kids who are learning about a time period that they didn't live through. And I say this as someone who's literally written a YA novel called 90s Kids. But when you have a brand built on teaching kids about the important socio-political issues for various time periods in history through the perspectives of kids just like them, it's a little disappointing when you completely throw away everything that was actually a big deal in the 90s. But honestly, if the conservatives want American Girl dolls to be for them, there's no better time than now. There's no better dolls than the 90s twins. These 90s twins do what American Girl never set out to do. They tone down history, erase the true stories being told lest they become too radical, and instead they have to face the real history of America. Now, instead of having to face the real history of America, you can have Isabel and Nikki who consume brand name items from so many giant corporations. You can even buy a coffee shop for them to work at doing child labor all while we whitewash history. Money and controlling the narrative. Sounds like American Girl dolls are more conservative than they've ever been. Make American Girl Great Again. Okay, so how do we make American Girl Great Again? I'd say a few things. First, if it were up to me and we had complete brand integrity, I'd separate this into two lines. Two separate brands even. American Girl makes sense for the names of the historical characters, the Truly Me dolls, assuming, assuming of course, that you bring back these blank books and the writing guides, please, uh, and also the Girls of the Year. But the Welly Wishers dolls, who I haven't even discussed in this video because I think they're irrelevant, and the Collector dolls, 
dolls, the collabs with brands that aren't actually grounded in reality, like Disney princesses or Harry Potter, those should be part of something separate. In my personal opinion, I would never say that these toys shouldn't exist. The more options for playing, the better. I love toys, and you guys know that I never call for there to be fewer toys in the world. But I do think what made American Girl special was its grounded universe. When we throw these other fantastical elements into the same universe, it gets confusing, at least to me. But what do I know? I'm just a 31-year-old who gets stoned off my ass every night and plays with my dolls until 2 in the morning. I also think there could be a lot more done to make the girls of the year even more relevant to their time periods. Some of them are doing fantastic, like Corinne's story about incorporating anti-Asian prejudice in America during the COVID outbreaks. But other dolls, like 2024's new girl Lila, fall flat. Now Lila is a gorgeous doll. I absolutely love her eyes. I love her freckles. I love her wavy hair. But her story is so cliche. A girl having to learn to balance gymnastics and horseback riding. Two very expensive hobbies, by the way. Sure, time management is an important skill for kids, but her story feels so empty to me. So why can't we have a girl like Charlotte as the focus? Why can't American Girl feature a transgender doll? The far right is gonna freak out no matter what you do. They freak out over a brief mention of two women getting married in Australia. You're not gonna keep them around no matter what you do at this point unless you keep leaning into constant 90s brand obsession. And what about when we're farther in the future? Will American Girl be willing to make, for example, a Muslim doll who experiences Islamophobia immediately following 9-11? Or will they avoid that because they had these two brand-obsessed Mary-Kate and Ashley knockoffs to stand in for the entirety of the Y2K era? Could American Girl ever make a girl of the year who wants to be maybe a comedian but has to learn about the nuances of free speech when she gets in trouble for making fun of political figures? figures at a school talent show? Or what about a girl who learns the struggle Americans have with our current healthcare system after her mom loses her job? What about a girl with two moms who has to flee Florida after increased anti-LGBTQ harassment in the wake of new laws being passed? These ideas might seem intense, but they are real struggles that real kids of today are going through. Just like American Girl was willing to tell the story of a girl who escapes slavery, a girl who watches Pearl Harbor get bombed, a girl who goes through the Great Depression, or a girl who combats conspiracy theories during the AIDS epidemic, why can't they tell these stories of today? So what are the politics of American Girl? American Girl, despite its focus on telling stories set in fairly controversial periods of American history, still remains an aggressively apolitical brand. It still wants to capture that centrist marketing of 90s media while we're in a world that doesn't view things that way anymore. It's much easier to look way back into the past, back to the 18th and 19th centuries, and write stories based on what we know now to be the right side of history. It's much harder to be living through history or even to look back on the history of just three or four decades past and correctly identify what the morally right or even ethically victorious ideology is or was. I don't necessarily think American Girl as a brand needs to align itself politically with a label. It shouldn't be a leftist brand or a radical brand. That wouldn't even make sense and no one would ever take it seriously now that it's owned by Mattel, a company worth billions of dollars. But I do think that when you have that much money, when you as a company have that many resources, you do have the power to create toys with serious serious, lasting impact. So what do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts about all this in the comments below. I will see you guys again soon, but for now, I'm off to go get stoned and play with my dolls until two in the morning. In the meantime, have a great start to your weekend. Bye, friends.